Divine Truth Paget Messages Discussions of Individual Messages Received by James Paget Jesus and Mary discuss the conditions under which divine love cannot continue to flow into a soul, the depth of God's love for all of his children. The message was received from Jesus on the 17th of September, 1916. This discussion was recorded on the 19th of June, 2013, in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Welcome today, everyone, for another discussion of a Paget message. I'm here with my soulmate, Jesus, and today we're discussing a message from him that was received by James Paget on the 17th of September, 1916. And the topic of this message is the conditions under which divine love cannot continue to flow into a soul, the depth of God's love for all of his children. I'm very excited about this message. I think it's very beautiful. And I'm going to hand over to my soulmate to read his own message. <laughs> <laughs> so how many paragraphs would you like me to read first? Uh, maybe just the first three. Okay. I, I am here, Jesus. I was with you tonight at the meeting and heard what the preacher said. And he declared some truths and also said some things that were not true. He said, only those who have been converted are sons of God. All men are the children of God, and his love and care are over all, and they are very dear to him. Otherwise, he would not have re-bestowed his love upon them and given them the privilege of becoming inhabitants of his celestial kingdom. The mere fact that they are sinners makes them no less his children, who is so anxious to redeem and fill with the divine love. And when the preacher says, they who are sinners are not the sons of God, he does not declare the truth. For they are all his sons, some to enjoy the pure life and bliss which the purification of their natural love will bring to them, and others to enjoy and inhabit the celestial kingdom which the new birth will bring to them. So I like that as an introduction because it basically <laughs> summarises really what you go on to explain in a lot more detail throughout mm. the message, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. yeah, quite often Paget uh, went to... You know, we, we sort of impressed upon him to go to a church or go to some kind of sermon or go to some kind of presentation given, you know, on spiritual matters. And, uh, and as I said in our last discussion, quite often near the end of our channeling to him, it was the only way in which we could actually <laughs> get further connections with him. So, so what we decided to try to arrange were these kind of meetings with different people and also going to the churches of different places and listening to ministers say certain things. And then, of course, it gave us an opening to tell him the truth about those particular subjects. It's sort of fascinating, isn't it, when he, he already had the source of this amazing truth communicating with him. And I imagine him sometimes, you know, or perhaps I'm recollecting him <laughs> in his study, you know, at night time, all on his own or with his friend and just channeling this really high calibre truth and then still seeking outside in the rest of the world or, or being impressed upon to, to do things that sparked his spiritual interest. Well, he had, he had a lot of doubts, as, mm. as you know, and mm. um, a lot more doubts than the pageant messages would actually imply. And uh, or that we could infer from reading them, but and and that becomes more and more obvious the more you progress through reading the messages, how much doubt he still really had in his soul, and while initially the doubt disappeared because of his emotional connection with his soulmate Helen, um, as time went on, his doubts about her even started to arise, and his doubts about a future life, you know, a future life after death, and things like that began to arise. And of course, that did influence quite a lot how much truth and information we could transmit to him. But that being said, when he went to one of these places, we, we often could, after that, he, you know, straight away he wanted to talk about that. And so that was yeah. great. And then we had the opportunity, depending on his condition, to, to discuss matters with him. The, the problem was by the time we hit 1917, he, he, the, the distance between these events uh, grew wider and as a result of that it became more increasingly difficult to share divine truth with him mm. over that period. But 1916 was a good time because we, we managed to share in 1915 and 1916 quite a lot of good messages with him. 
Mm. And on this occasion, he's obviously been to a sermon where the preacher is telling mm. people that only certain people are saved, believers are saved and loved by God. Mm. It's, yeah. it's one of the most terrible things, actually, that I feel people who have received divine love have a tendency to do. Once they've received divine love and do feel to a degree that they have a sort of certain sonship or daughtership with God, if you like, they then begin to imply that if you haven't received divine love, that you're not a son or a daughter of God. And in fact, in fact, they even go so far as to declare the wrath of God upon those particular people who haven't received God's love. And, and this is a very damaging thing, as I've stated in this and other messages, mm. a very damaging thing that people who have received love can do. And um, it, if you look at the problems with faiths on the planet, there is always this tendency in all sorts of religious faiths, not just the Christian faith, to declare that what they believe is true and they are, and they are the only sons of God as a, as a result of what they declare mm. and, and therefore condemn all others as being, um, uh, in many cases, even condemned to hell or condemned to some kind of eternal torment. And if not that, eternal damnation. And, uh, and these are very, very damaging teachings that exist in a lot of religious faiths, but, but particularly in Christianity. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so if we proceed, we can perhaps talk, talk about that a little bit more after mm. you read the next paragraph. I was just thinking before I do too, uh, this whole concept that God really loves all of her children is a concept that not many people really understand. And I can see why on the planet, because... The reality is we grow up in environments, in family-based environments, where we don't really feel loved or known or understood in most cases. It's rare to find a person who reflects upon their childhood and actually believes that their mother or father know them and understand them rather than just feel their own concept of their child. Mm. And, and so for that reason, most people have a very distorted view of how God sees them. And this distortion causes a huge lack of faith in God, a huge lack of faith in the desire to connect to God, but also it causes a lot of problems with their own self-esteem and self-worth, where they feel that they're not the worthy, you know, not mm. someone who's worthy enough for God to want to connect to, not someone who's worthy to be God's child. And so then they start coming up with beliefs and concepts that focus on this, this idea that, only certain people who believe certain things are worthy. Um, which is, and that's really tantamount to saying that you have to earn love by it, doing and exactly. being a certain way, which is not, not the truth. Not true at all. Um, no. It's not the truth about any kind of love. Real love never requires a payment or a, a set of... Or a service or anything yes, else. Yeah. yeah. And not only that, um, real love doesn't demand that the person believes the same as you do in order to love them. Mm. And God does not expect us to believe the same as God does in order for God to love us. Yeah. And the reality is for the majority of people on earth, they have come, come up with human constructed belief systems, which they've then attributed to God. And then they also, in order to control other people, try to force them upon others by threatening them with the lack of God's love at least, if not, if not hellfire and torment and damnation, <laughs> yes. at least they threaten other people with, you know, God's not going to love you while you believe that particular thing. And, and the truth is God loves us all the time. It's just that we don't feel it. Yes. And because of our certain blockages, we're not open to the reception of love. Yeah. Mm. And I feel often I've heard people pay lip service to this idea that God, no, God loves all of us, you know. Mm. Um, I've, I've heard uh, people of Christian persuasion and other people sort of, as I said, give that lip service. Mm -hmm. But when examining with them their actual belief systems, their actual, the way their faith works, their faith in this loving God. And their own actions. And their own actions towards others. Mm -hmm. It demonstrates that that is not a belief that resides in their heart exactly. because they live with favoritism, they live with judgment, they, you know, they display a lot of qualities um, that don't reflect what they understand God believe God feels about them and yep. and the way God would desire them to act towards others if they were being loving. Exactly. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Just check my mic because I I think I've I, I've had it on. Yes, yeah. that's good. Thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, so... so if, if you want to um, just continue with that and maybe pause just after the next paragraph because it, it's further to what we've just been mm -hmm. talking about. But all are his sons, though some have wandered and become strangers to his love, just as was the prodigal son who left his father's house for a far country. This doctrine of the sinful not being sons of God is a damnable and harmful doctrine and will cause many to give up hope of ever becoming anything else than the sons of perdition, or as these orthodox say, of the devil, sons mm. of the devil. Yeah, I wanted to talk really about, firstly, why this is such a, a damaging doctrine and why it does lead people to really become hopeless and to really mm -hmm. live, there you're saying the sons of perdition or the sons of the devil, which is really... Well, what are you trying to say by that statement? Well, basically what I was trying to imply was even in the first century, even though there was not a Bible as we have it today, there were, there were holy books, of course, particularly books that were written from the prophets and also the Torah the first, in the first five books of the Bible. And many of them tended to imply that if a person didn't do things a certain way, then they were no longer of God, they were of the devil. Mm -hmm. And, and this whole concept of um, being condemned and damnable is a, is a very damaging concept because it stops people from ever having any hope of the future. And now it's very interesting how it stops that because we see it even more in the spirit world than we do here. Yeah. Because a lot of people hold on to a belief system here all of their life because their family has and their society has. They, they personally then hold on to the same belief system. And so they have the same belief system all of their life without it really engaging their heart in any way with regard to love. And then when they pass, of course, because their heart is not developed in love, they pass into one of the hells, so-called hells of the spirit world. And these hells are not, you know, places of fiery torment and other things, but rather they are the direct reflection of the heart of the individual. So if the heart of the individual is cold and hard, then their environment is cold and hard. And uh, the people that they are all surrounding at the time are all cold and hard. And, and, and so, you know, the, but once the person passes and they arrive in that location, they then feel that everything that they learnt was either completely false or that there was something, and if completely false, they believe then that they are damned because yeah. that's what they were taught. They yeah. were taught that anyone who believed anything that was completely false was damned. Yes. And so they then assume the position of the damned, if you like. Mm -hmm. And when I say assume it, they, they then believe inside of themselves that they have no hope to get out of their current condition. Mm -hmm. And there is so much hopelessness in the world, in the in the spirit world, in the first dimension of the spirit world, compared to you know religious faiths on earth, you know, in some cases, religious faiths on earth have more hope, <laughs> only to have that hope destroyed in their passing, and then because of their own teachings, they feel condemned personally, and they they don't recognise that actually if all of their if if the hopeful part of their teaching was false then maybe the, the lack of hope part of their teaching was also <laughs> yeah. false. And so they have this tendency then to believe everything that they, that they have been taught that, uh, that matches their current condition and they feel they can't get out of the hells then. And there are many spirits in the spirit world who have given up hope completely as a result. Yeah, I also see how this kind of doctrine is, really leads to a lot of hopelessness on earth. When people, for example, have been raised in a Christian faith or a faith that has this kind of doctrine that God mm. only loves certain people or there are only certain saved people, and then they find, for example, that they're homosexual soul. Mm. I've read stories written by people who go through extreme torment, you know, mm. over the fact that they feel now God doesn't love them. They feel completely hopeless for the, for the future of their life because they've attempted to rid themselves of what they think is this sinful part of their nature and find that they can't. Yeah, I feel that's a bit different, though, than what we've been talking about because the reality is, from God's perspective, that such people aren't sinful unless they engage in promiscuity. So, so I think we've got to be very careful that we draw the line, even here in our discussions, of what is actually untrue compared to what the religions say are untrue. So uh, I feel 
there, there are certain things the religions say are untrue that are not true that are that are that are not untrue <laughs> yeah oh, well, you're gonna need <laughs> now an example confused. here yeah <laughs> yeah so, so give an example the religions say god is a god of wrath mm -hmm. now god is not a god of wrath no that's so a so yep. so so the religion teachings that god is a god of wrath under certain circumstances is untrue mm -hmm. completely untrue and um, now all untruth will be dispelled at some point in the future the same with it comes to homosexuality the, pr the principle that homosexuals are, because of their very nature, sinful, is untrue. Mm -hmm. The reality is God created souls that split into two, and sometimes the split means male-male, sometimes the split means female-female, and sometimes the split means female-male, and our attractions, sexual attractions, are all based around a soul attraction. So that's the truth. Yes. We've got to be very careful that we separate what religions say is true to what is really the truth. Now, now what, I, what I was talking about here is even some of the things that people believe are true. So the sins that are actually sins, sins from God's from perspective. From God's perspective. Still does not, if I'm a sinner in that context, it still does not prevent me from receiving God's love. Exactly. Whereas homosexuality is not a sin from God's perspective. Yes. It's only a sin from, it's only a sin in humans' eyes. Yes. It's not a sin in God's perspective. Promiscuity is a mm -hmm. sin in God's perspective. So, so there's a difference between God's perspective here and humans' perspective. Certainly. And we need to make sure that we're clear about that. So when we talk about homosexuality and refer to it in the same sentence as sin, it's not sin from God's perspective. It's only I, sin from human perspective. Let it be very clear. <laughs> I don't think it's a sin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but um, I was, sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, what I, was, so what I was trying to do there is just make sure that people understand that, that we need to be very clear that there are some things that humans say are sin, which are not. There are some things that humans say are not sin, which are. Yes. <laughs> In fact, there's quite a long list of those. <laughs> then there are some things that, uh, that are actually sin from God's perspective, but you can still recover from them. That's what the point is. Whereas this, the, the whole principle of be becoming damnable means that you're damned forever, that you're, you, you can't recover for them once you engage them. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where a very damaging, this is the doctrine that I'm talking about, this damaging doctrine that even if you do commit a sin from God's perspective, the doctrine is you can't be saved from that, right? And there are some sp statements in the Bible that certain things can't, you can't be saved from. So for example, it says a sin against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. Now that is not true. It's just while you're sinning against the Holy Spirit, it can't be forgiven because the whole process of forgiveness is through the Holy Spirit. So, you know, when you allow the Holy Spirit to connect with you, now, of course, the sin against the Holy Spirit has ceased from that moment. And so then it's, it, it's a process of a, that particular idea or concept's not, not true. So, and, and many people have also this idea that if you die a sinner, and this is where a lot of the... Christian religious belief systems come from. You've got to have a deathbed confession mm -hmm. because if you don't have the deathbed confession, you're going to arrive in the spirit world of sin. Well, well, frankly, if you've been living your life of sin all through your life from God's perspective, you're going to arrive in the spirit world whether you have a confession or not. <laughs> in a dark <laughs> having, place. In a dark place, having to actually deal with the results of all of the things you chose to do. But I suppose what you're trying to say also in this message is that even if you do arrive in that place, you're still not, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. Exactly. This is what it gets to the prodigal son, the, the illustration I gave about the prodigal son. It's one of the most important illustrations in the Bible, trying to illustrate the depth of God's love and also the attitude of the brother is very interesting because that is the current attitude of many Christians interestingly enough, mm -hmm. and the attitude of many Muslims, if a person's not a Muslim, and the attitude of many people of, who are adherents of specific belief systems towards those who are not believers of the same system. Mm -hmm. The attitude of the brother towards his brother who took the inheritance, went away, squandered it, became like a, a person in a very dark condition, eventually repented for his actions, came back to his father and just wanted to work for his father, and his father welcomed him back as a son, 
the attitude of the brother was one of jealousy and anger and resentment towards his father. And many people do not want to give up this concept of an angry, wrathful God because they want God to punish their brothers. <laughs> they want God to punish those brothers that have walked away from God and then had, want to come back at a later stage. And, and I was trying to illustrate through that, that entire illustration, not only the attitude of God, this beautiful love that comes, that, that particularly is triggered through this process of repentance, but also the attitude of the brother. And I find it very ironic that many Christians reading this particular passage in the Bible do not see themselves as that wrathful brother <laughs> who are antagonistic towards their brothers who have left the teachings or the truth of God, if you like, from their perspective. Yeah, can we talk about that a little bit more? And mm. perhaps for people who aren't familiar with that parable, there's a, a parable in the Bible of two sons who have a father and one stays and works for his father while the other takes his inheritance and goes out into the world. And he squanders in his inheritance and he comes back and the father welcomes him and, in fact, throws a big party for him. Mm -hmm. And the first brother feels like, hey, I've been here doing the right thing and he's getting the party. Mm. And um, as you said, there's a lot of messages about the way God loves mm. in that um, parable. Mm. But you're saying that a lot of uh, Christians, a lot of people of any sort of faith who feel like, hey, I'm here doing the right thing, I should get the brownie points. Mm -hmm. um, they are they're already by that attitude indicating that they're doing the right thing for the wrong reason. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> exactly. Their motivation is not based on it. Because when we want to desire God's laws from a, from a pure place, mm. love is driving those actions, isn't mm -hmm. it? It is a feeling of, it doesn't feel like, oh, I've got to obey. It feels like, I love obeying this. This is And we're also not resentful of people who disobey. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because we don't feel like we're doing a hardship. We don't no. feel like we're, you know, having a hard time doing the right thing. And we that, desire to do And in it. fact, in the illustration, I actually demonstrated that, that the father said to the, the brother, who is je jealous and resentful? You've been with me all this time. You've been you you've got a party every night. Yes. Really, is what he's really saying, right? <laughs> you've had a party every night. This man, you're the, your brother. He's had all of this darkness and hardship as a result of his choices, and he's sorry for that cho those yeah. choices. And I want to welcome him back into the house. You know, like, yeah. and you know, sometimes people who do things without their heart being involved do feel, of course, like it is a chore. And then they became resentful when somebody else is given a gift. And that uh, obviously shows the lack of pure motive in their, in their reasons for the actions that they take normally. Yeah, and, and I've discussed at other times um, the furor that has arisen amongst Christian groups when um, Rob Bell, who's another Christian in America, suggested that perhaps hell didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And there was an utter furor. And... And I feel that that demonstrates the same principle, yes. that people feel resentful that others who are not doing what they believe to be right are not punished for this. Mm. It shows that their, their motivation is and It shows not... that they have not only, a one, a desire for people who do not believe to be punished, mm -hmm. which is actually a very unloving desire, but secondly, their own, their own reasons for doing it are to avoid punishment. Yes. And that's also not a very pure motivation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I suppose in this message, really you're discussing the attitude of a preacher who has many of those similar attitudes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, the majority of Christian preachers who pre preach hellfire and damnation generally have that same kind of attitude. And, and a lot of these attitudes come from this concept that if you do the right thing, you should be rewarded, but if you do the wrong thing, you should be punished, mm. without there being much of a knowledge of how God corrects the behaviour of all of his children. Yeah. So they don't have much understanding of God's laws and generally how they work. They sort of see God as, instead of God, a God of a, is a God having laws that govern all of the universe, they almost see God as a punitive person who makes a judgment on every single issue um, based on whether the person did something right or wrong. 
And in, when you think about it, the majority of people that we talk to don't want to develop a relationship with God for this reason, mm -hmm. because they believe that God's going to be something like their daddy or their mummy, and mostly their daddy. <laughs> and, uh, and, and their daddies might have been violent at times or punishing at times and, and might have resorted to corporal physical punishment at times. And they sort of see God being much the same thing. You know, if you don't agree with God, you get a belt. And if you do, you might get a reward. Mm. Might get mm. a reward, you know. But it's and, expected you should be good just... Yeah, you, but it's expected by God that you should yeah. be good. Yeah. And, and, and often in the Bible, if you look at the Bible's record of God, God's really expecting us to be better than God is in a lot of ways yeah. <laughs> because God's allowed to kill people, but we're not. And God's allowed to like, murder thousands of people all at once, but we're not <laughs> and things like that. Well, so, but that's, again, now we're talking about something that's not true about God. Just of course. Just written in the Bible. Of course. Yes. And this is, the, this is what I was getting at in this, in this. When we have these false concepts of God, we are, it's very highly unlikely that we will have a pure longing for love to flow into our soul. And this is one of the primary conditions under which love will not flow. Love will not flow into our soul while we hold on to erroneous and damaging and actually blasphemous viewpoints of God. Mm -hmm. We have to have God's viewpoint of God, at least even intellectually, before we can even develop within us a pure desire to receive love from God. Yeah. And many of the people we talk to do not have that attitude about God because they've yet to release their attitudes about their parents. They don't believe such a love actually can exist and they don't have any faith that it can exist. And, yeah. and I find that quite sad because, because it's actually God who's better than all all in terms of love, better than any person you can ever imagine. And it's sad that so much love is available to the individual, but most people are not, they're too scared to be like the prodigal son in some ways. Like most of the earth is, and this includes most people from all sorts of religions, are like the prodigal son living in the mire, but they are too frightened to go through any repentance. And they are also too frightened of God to think that they can ever get back to God, really. And so they, in, their, in, their, in that state, yeah. create a whole heap of false beliefs about God yeah. as their way of almost justifying not releasing those beliefs and coming back to understand God's true nature. It's quite a powerful picture you just painted there, actually. If we, if we use that parable of the prodigal son, so we have the two sons. One of them is living with his father, um, but not motivated by a feeling of love or actual desire to be there. No. Um, and then on the other hand, we have the other son who is out living with the pigs, <laughs> you know, in this terrible condition. Mm. And let's imagine for a minute that he didn't come home. He just stays out there because he remains afraid of his father. Mm -hmm. And really from what you or said... Or even thinking that his way of life was correct. You know? Yeah, yeah. And we, it's almost as if... On the earth, there's a lot of people who could um, either be, uh, we could relate to the son who's living at home with the father, mm -hmm. um, but not motivated by pure desires. And so there's mm -hmm. actually a lot of unloving feelings within them mm -hmm. towards others who aren't living with their father. And towards God. their father. And towards <laughs> their father. There's a lot of false beliefs about yeah, their father. Like I would, and, I would classify having a belief about God where you think God's going to be wrathful and angry and, and murder millions of people come Armageddon, which is mm -hmm. the Bible teaching, uh, which of course is incorrect, but that's the Bible teaching. If you believe that, then, then really you're believing in a God that's wrathful and quite angry and damaging, and you want him to be such. Mm -hmm. um, and that's nothing like the God you're actually meant to be with. Like yes. that, the God you, you could be with is nothing like that. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, and so, and that is really what that son's attitude was. Mm -hmm. He wanted his father to punish his mm -hmm. brother when mm -hmm. he came home. Yeah. And then, if we look at the other, then there's massive amounts of people living on the earth who aren't happy, who mm -hmm. know that they aren't happy, but mm -hmm. are either afraid to see the truth about their life and mm -hmm. what's making them unhappy, mm -hmm. um, or they're afraid to open their heart to God, to reach out to God because they they have all these false beliefs about what God's well, nature yeah, is. Yeah, even worse than that, they, they've they been taught all of these false beliefs, mm. these, particularly one like this one, the damnable, you know, the, the person becomes damned or of the devil. They've taught these particular false beliefs and then they believe them in their heart even though they're not practising them. Yeah. They believe them and, and that belief it stops them 
from making the steps to come back out of their condition and into a better condition. And I suppose that's what I was trying to mention earlier, is that you were saying how these doctrines that of God being, you know, very punishing of sinners, that affects us if we hold that belief when we enter the spirit world and we enter a dark place. But I also see that it affects a lot of us while we're still on earth. Yes. Even if we don't have a conscious thought, I believe God will punish me, mm-hmm. If we start to come to realisations of, of how we are not loving, mm-hmm. so this is real sin now, this mm-hmm. is something where I, I, become, I open my heart, my conscience is knocking on me and saying, look, the way you treated your sister in that situation was really not loving. And for some of us, there's big things we've done in our past that where we feel really bad about mm-hmm. them. But if we carry this, this unspoken belief that actually... But I can't have, I've got to fix this all by myself because my only concept of God is they're not going to be compassionate towards this feeling that I have. They're Mm. going to make me pay. Mm. So I'm just going to have to deal with this all on my own. That can lead to a very hopeless place even while we live on earth, can't Mm -hmm. it? Because you Mm -hmm. feel you try to fix it and Mm -hmm. then you feel I can't. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to fix this. And now I just think I'm a woeful person forever. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and the the problem with hopelessness is that it creates this uh, underlying lack of motivation to get yourself out of anything. Yes. uh, Because you feel like there's no hope for you even if you try. Yeah. And uh, that's not the case, of course. God's always wanting to provide hope. But a lot of human doctrines and belief systems all all want people to feel hopeless. Yeah. They they actually want to motivate people into hopelessness. And, And I feel a lot of these doctrines and teachings are so damaging, not only to the person's relationship with God, but also to the person's relationship with themselves. As I said up here, um, it's not the mere fact that they are sinners. (laughs) Now, I use the term mere fact for a good reason. It's a minor problem. (laughs) It's not not like this mountainous problem when we're a sinner. It's a minor problem in that we can cure it. Mm-hmm. All sin can be removed from our soul, not by belief in Jesus' blood or any mm-hmm. of those other things, but through a process with God. All sin can be removed from your soul. Yeah. So the mere fact that we are sinners means relatively nothing to God in the sense that God knows that all of us can get out of it. And God knows that while we're sinners, we're going to bear the consequences of the sin, which are always going to be pain and suffering. But... God knows that we can actually step out of that place. And, and the mere fact that we are sinners makes us no less God's children than if we were doing everything right. Yeah. From God's perspective, we're still his children. And when you think about it, of course that makes sense. Any person who has ever had a child here on earth generally feels that whether their child is a disobedient person or a person who's obedient, although often sometimes not no, the case, yeah. but, but most parents would go, they're still my child. I still care about them. I still love them. I still want you know, to see the best for them and all those kind of things. Even if they're choosing to go off the rails, I would still like to see them do the best. Now, unfortunately, most, a lot of parents want to punish them for all of that, and I'm not, I don't agree with any of that. But the, the average parent, before they reach that stage, generally still feels like the disobedient child is still their child, mm-hmm. just as God does. Mm-hmm. And to, to call a person who, who is disobedient no longer a son of God or a daughter of God is the beginnings of some very dangerous, of a very dangerous road, both in terms of their blasphemy towards God, mm-hmm. but also in terms of the, the, the depth of damage that is done to the psyche of a person who accepts such a belief. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's continue. The Father's mercy is for all. And if certain of his children do not choose to seek and receive the divine love, which, when possessed, will make angels of them, yet they are his sons and will, in the fullness of time or before the time of the great consummation, become pure and happy beings, as were the parents before the fall. So here I'm saying, here I'm saying there's these two hopes. Both hopes are good. Mm-hmm. There's not such, such thing as, you know, everlasting damnation in hell and then the other hope, you know. The reality is, whether you're religious or not, you have the hope of becoming the perfect human, just as Ammon and a man were before the fall, which was the fall into sin Mm -hmm. that occurred and and the subsequent pain and suffering that resulted. 
we have just, all of us have ahead of us that hope, whether, what, no matter what we choose. Yeah. The, there's the second class of people who will choose to receive God's love and then they will have the hope of the divine angel. But that's even better again. <laughs> it's not it's like, all good news. It's all good news. <laughs> <laughs> there's no bad news in our long-term future. It's just what we decide to do and how long it takes to engage both or one or both of those particular futures. And what I feel happens is that when uh, religious faiths create belief systems where there's either this good future or a bad future, now there's heavy manipulation of the individual's will. They are, they are you creating these belief systems in order to manipulate and control the individual. The reality is there is only good, there is only good ahead of us. That, that is it. And you can be an atheist or a believer in, in God or whatever. It makes no difference. You have just as much hope ahead of you one, in one way or the other. There is only one difference, and that is if you choose to engage a relationship with God, there's even better things <laughs> ahead of you after yeah. that. Yeah. But, but uh, certainly nothing worse than the perfect natural man. Yeah, and I feel that that is just such a beautiful truth of the way God's constructed our universe, mm. his universe but that we live in, that every single part of it is designed to lead us towards a good future. Mm. It's all there. There's mm. nothing punishing. There's nothing punitive. It's all there just to help us learn and grow. Mm -hmm. God made us learning, growing beings. Mm -hmm. And there is just, uh, all we have to do is understand our will. Mm. As, and as we come to understand it, if we go towards the things that are, you know, that God is showing us, even when we're an atheist, mm -hmm. um, there's only good stuff. Mm -hmm. And when we choose not to, when we just choose to sit in our stuff and mm -hmm. make, you know, not great choices. And unloving choices. Unloving choices. The feedback's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And that's all there just to help give us a wake-up call <laughs> to go, oh, I'll make a different choice. Yeah. And it never stops. We never stop having the choice to mm -hmm. make another choice. Mm -hmm that is more loving or more in harmony with, you know, what's going to make us happy. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. the inevitability, it's, I know it's not inevitable because we have to harness our will. Yes. Um, but there is just so much help and assistance for all of us. And it is inevitable in some ways, given yeah. the length of time, you know, over <laughs> tens or hundreds of thousands of years, eventually you're going to come <laughs> to the recollection that you'll either become the perfect <laughs> natural man or you'll become an angel of God. Either way, you're yeah. going to do it over. Because, because the way all of God's universal laws are always acting towards your correction. That's why I sort of feel like it's inevitable. You know, it's yeah. going to happen. God created us with a pain, you know, with pain mechanisms so that we would eventually make yeah. another choice. And yeah, redemption is inevitable. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah. And I also feel that uh, the world's religions aren't very clever at all. The main reason why they're not clever is they believe in a God that's not clever. Yeah. Like a God that's clever wouldn't create a system where punitive, violent actions have to be created in order to correct somebody. You know, this is not a system that, of God's creation. It's, an, it's what man creates. And God has created a, a system where everything has a, every action has a reaction mm -hmm. in order to correct it if it's out of harmony with love. And every action has a reaction that's supportive if it's in harmony with love. Yeah. And, and all of God's laws are engaged in this way. And we've got to give away man's concept of... God's universe, because man's concept of God's universe, particularly the people who've become religious, have a concept of God's universe, which is very, very simple, simplistic and also quite ludicrous at mm. times. And, and to think that a person who has the ability to create our own body, which is an intricate operation of, of uh, you know, in, in terms of an, in, an intricate animal, you know, like the body is, the animal part of us, the body, the physical body, is an intricate design full of wonder and, and amazing capabilities. And, and then to believe that that same creator would come up with a stupid system for dealing with people who, who are out of harmony with love 
his, his, <laughs> it defies the imagination to think that one can be true and then the other can be true. Yes. And this is why I feel quite frequently that I'm surprised by how many doctrines religions create that, that are obviously totally illogical and without any support in nature and yet they want to hold on to them. And, the, and I can see why they do it. It's because they've been brought up with a father like that or brought up with a mother like that and they then impose that upon a religious or spiritual foundation. In fact, they're attracted they're attracted to it. To it because it feels right, because yeah. that's the way they've grown up. But there's not much logic in it no. because if you look at the intricacies of the human body, for example, and then think if, if someone's so clever as to design such a thing from a genetic code, mm -hmm. then how clever would they be about the universe? <laughs> and, and in my mind, they're going to be a lot cleverer about the universe in which the body exists mm -hmm. than they are about the body itself. And so that tends to suggest to me that if anything doesn't come across as very, very clever in terms of the way we examine the universe and come up with theories about how God works and yeah. operates it, then we need to discard that yeah. <laughs> teaching and throw it out the door because in the end, it's proof that if it's not more clever than the human form is itself and the way it operates, then obviously there must be a problem. Yeah. It's not attributed to a God who's, who's more clever than the creation. Yeah. And this is one of the things that I was, we were always trying to get across to Padgett, uh, difficult at times to get across, but uh, one of the things we were always trying to get across to him. Mm. Mm. Okay. Going? Okay. And while this preacher has a great amount of the divine love in his soul and is earnestly and in the right way seeking for more, yet his beliefs and teachings as to the destiny and future condition of those who may receive this love and become at one with the Father are all wrong and will tend to retard his own progress in the development of his soul and in his advancement towards the kingdom of God. Mm. So this is really interesting, I feel, because you're saying that this preacher has received God's love mm -hmm. and yet he's preaching a false doctrine. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's going to have some... It's going to prevent him receiving more of God's love. Mm -hmm. But there's another, there's another repercussion, really, isn't there? When well, I think there's quite a lot of things here, isn't yes. there? You want to yes. mention your first repercussion and I might mention a few others. <laughs> yeah, well, no, you go right <laughs> ahead. <Yeah. laughs> um, well, really, just that there's a lot... Well, I can, again, that, yeah, I can agree, there's a lot. There's the repercussions on, in terms of him teaching a false doctrine to others. That's going to have a huge repercussion upon his soul. Exactly. The, that's something that I think... Um, is well worth people in a public um, role thinking about because their words and actions are influencing others. And if they're mm -hmm. influencing others in towards areas of falsehood, mm -hmm. then that, that actually, some of that is attributed to their soul. The mm -hmm. actions taken as a result of their words are attributed to, to their soul condition. And it's interesting, even the Bible says that. The Bible says that if you are to become a teacher, you need to take a lot of care because there, there is a far greater responsibility on a person who's a teacher than a person who's just listening. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I suppose the other repercussion that comes to mind when I read that is about the pain that the preacher himself will begin to incur mm -hmm. because he's acting in disharmony with the love that he's already received. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the, if you like, the repercussion of using your will out of harmony with the love that's already in your soul. So in this, pre this preacher's desire to hold on to his own belief systems that are out of harmony with the divine love that he has personally received and his uh, desire to hold on to a belief system about the punishment of other people, which is not only a belief system about other people but also a belief system about God. So there's quite a number of false belief systems he's willing to hold on to. Every single one of those belief systems will have its own repercussion on his soul and the souls of others that he teaches. Yeah. And this is the sad thing is that it, there's repercussions everywhere for his action. So even though he knew that you had to long for the love with your heart, you had to bring yourself emotionally into the space where you wanted to have it, that was what prayer was, he knew that, mm -hmm. he understood how to receive divine love. The reality was that he would not receive more, he would finish up receiving less and less love as he progressed because he was unwilling to give up the false 
doctrines and beliefs. Mm. And he was also willing at the same time to harm others with the false doctrines and beliefs. Yeah. And, uh, and so therefore cause uh, damage and, uh, to the souls of others. Yeah. And of course there is always going to be a consequence of our taking a purposeful action which causes damage to other people, mm. whether we believe it causes damage or not. Yeah. Mm. This concept of acting in disharmony <coughs> with the love that we've already received, would you like to talk about that here or further as we go on? Because there's probably some more I'd like to discuss with you. Yeah, about. we tried to get a lot of messages to Paget about this problem, a problem that we saw happening on earth very frequently, particularly amongst people of the Christian faith, where they'd received a certain amount of divine love from God because they desired it, but uh, as a result of their doctrines and beliefs held on to blasphemous doctrines with regard to God, held on to uh, doctrines that harmed the uh, psychological welfare of their brothers and sisters, and also that were untrue, and the effects of untruth upon pe people's hope and people's faith. And yet uh, many of them would receive divine love for the, in the first part of their connection with God. And then after some years, they would uh, no longer be receiving or be conscious of receiving that love. And as a result, they would often say, well, that was what it's like to be born again. I was born again back then, mm -hmm. you know, back then at that point when I did receive some God's love. That's what transformed me. That's what caused me to accept the blood of Jesus. And, and they say all these kind of things. And in the process of saying all those kind of things, they are forgetting that now they're not receiving it. Now, right now, they are not receiving God's love for good reason, mm -hmm. even though they might have a longing for it. And that's because of how they're exercising their will out of harmony with the love they've already received. Mm. And, and we can't expect to continue receiving a gift when we treat the gift with, you know, um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Probably when we treat the gift well, with disregard. disregard or even um, I think in many cases it's even stronger than that. I feel a lot of people treat the gift with almost complete dismissal. Yeah. Um, so they, it's almost like most people who receive divine love in the first instance almost see it as God should have given it to them. And, mm -hmm. and then they hold on to their false belief systems and they still expect God should give them more. And the, re the reality is if God is not giving you more and more and more love every time you ask for it, every time you have a sincere longing for it, it is proof, just like it was in, would have eventually become proof for this man, it is proof that you are now exercising your will out of harmony with the love that you've received and you cannot receive any more. Why do you do that? Yeah, it's really interesting for me because my feelings about this matter is the more of God's love I receive, the more it directs my will. If I'm sensitive to it... And it, if you're humble. Right, yes. And I don't actually understand how you can have a sincere longing for God's love and not be humble. Well, it's pretty easy. Uh, like a lot of people initially in the moment have a sincere, and in that moment they are humble. Mm -hmm. but, but the moment doesn't continue for very long. And in fact, once they've received God's love, sometimes people actually have a feeling of superiority over another. You see many people in the Christian faith like this where they've received some divine love and then they feel as a result of them receiving divine love that they are superior to those who haven't. Yes. And that flicks in, at, so they're now out of their humility into arrogance now, of course, their soul is working, they're exercising their will against receiving more love. So I see that. Yeah. But it's also about, I feel a lot of times, our emotional predispositions through our emotional injuries. You see, many of us have a large amount of emotional injuries which we are very unwilling to acknowledge. And it's the emotional injuries we're unwilling to acknowledge that influence greatly whether we continue to receive divine love or not, or even can even begin to receive divine love or not. Yeah. For many who have become Christian, they have received divine love in the initial instance of their connection with God. But because of their other emotional injuries, which they're holding on to in their self-righteous justification, they are now going to block the possession of more love. 
Yes, and I suppose what I was feeling, I can see how that happens. Mm. People uh, receive some love and then they, um, as you said, because there's other emotional injuries that haven't been released from them, they begin to use the receipt of that love in towards their own addictive purposes that, mm. the, other, that mm. the remaining error within them causes them to do. Mm. But my, I suppose what I'm trying to relate is my experience of how receiving divine love makes us much more sensitive and therefore provides us with an opportunity, if we're humble, to actually begin to have more awareness of what is loving and what is not. Would you agree with that statement? Um, yes, but again, it has its limitations with regard to our will. God, God's love cannot motivate us to go and do something that our will is actually against doing. And this is where God has placed our will as a very important part of this entire process. And for God, our will is paramount. So God is not going to influence us in any way against our will. Our will has to be engaged in a positive direction. So, so let's say I do have a desire to receive some of God's love. So I receive some. And then inside of me too, after I've received some of this love, inside of me too, I still have a will to hurt other people. Now, God's love will make me more sensitive to the fact that I am hurting other people. But only if I'm willing to see it. Mm. Only if I'm willing to actually take stock of what's really going on. The law of attraction will be heightened. It will show me through the heightened law of attraction what's wrong. But if I'm still unwilling, I will not see it. Mm. And I will choose to not see it and therefore be acting out of harmony of love. And so I can see, yes, I, I was never meaning to imply that God would influence my will. I just meant that... I, it, the sensitivity res resulting from... Can I just state, when you make a comment like that, I wasn't implying it. Oh, okay. So, so what I'm just taking for the audience's yeah, sake yeah. is, is how, how, in fact, we can, you know, use God's will or our own will in, in direct disharmony with the love you receive. Because your question is, and you still have some feelings about it, your question is, how is it then that these people receive some divine love and don't become more sensitive? That's basically the question, isn't it? Why don't they become more sensitive and notice that they're doing something wrong? <laughs> yeah, but I can also see where I've received love and I haven't wanted to see... Exactly. ..which is where I'm headed, <laughs> yeah. And so, and so I, I sort of feel that just because a person's received divine love, sure, it does make them more sensitive... But again, you can use your will to detune the sensitivity. Yeah. So it doesn't guarantee sensitivity towards the fact that you're breaking the law. No. Well, I think it does. I think it guarantees <laughs> sensitivity to it, but you can live in denial of that. And the resulting thing is more, it's additional pain, really. Yeah, I can't agree. Can't agree. No, because, because sensitivity is not about what the love does to you so much as what you choose to do with the love in you. Do you see what I'm saying? It's sort of like you can choose, you, like for example, yeah. um, you can be faced with a situation with, two, with a person where you see them in a really poor state and you, and you have the means to help them, mm -hmm. right? And you may have a lot of love in your soul and yet not choose to help them because you have one fear only. Yes. You might have a fear that they might yell at you mm -hmm. and that causes you to not help them even though you're sensitive. Mm -hmm. So... It's the sensitivity towards your fear that you are blocked, not the sensitivity towards the problem. Do you, do you understand the difference? And then what I'm saying is mm -hmm. when we receive divine love, it doesn't guarantee that our fear will be removed. No, I agree. Right? That's the reason why we wouldn't act. Exactly. Yes. So, and, and, and since it doesn't guarantee our fear will be removed, we have to ask ourselves what is the cause of the fear remaining in us and what's the cause is our unwillingness to release it. Yes. That's the cause. And, and so there's it's a very fine distinction between our becoming more sensitive because we have more love in us and then our becoming more sensitive in a certain direction. So, so for example, we will become more sensitive to human needs but we might still be totally insensitive towards our own fear mm -hmm. and therefore shut down towards our own fear at the same time. I see. See, just go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my feeling internally was uh, that 
really receiving divine love makes me more sensitive to both things and I have to use, say in the example you've just given, I have to use extra will and sometimes I do in order to like suppress that fear. Yeah, and, I don't agree. Because right. let's look at what we were discussing yesterday. We were discussing how you up until recently had a faith for the error. Yes. And this is really what this problem is here. I agree. This yeah. preacher has a faith in the error. He, he, he has faith in something that's not actually true. Exactly. Yes. He's got faith that God is a God of wrath. Yes. And he actually wants that to be true desperately. So even though he's received some, God, some of God's love, which may make him more sensitive in certain areas of his life, it's not going to make him sensitive in that particular area of his life because he has a desire to hold on to the false belief. That's where his faith is. And unless he lets go of that desire to hold on to the false belief, he won't change no matter how much love he receives. So he, 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 the love he receives will not make him more sensitive to that problem. Does that make sense? He has got to choose at some point to, to become sensitive to that problem at some point. He's got to use his will in order to do so. Mm -hmm. Now, while he's receiving more and more love, obviously there's a greater influence upon his will to actually make that choice in the end. But it doesn't guarantee sensitivity because what, from what I've seen, some people who have received love have instantly after receiving love gone out and even murdered people thinking because of another error that they were insensitive to. Does that make sense? It makes sense, but it doesn't make sense in my <laughs> internal world. So that's okay. I don't well, want to well, sully a, the teaching because yeah, I but think if, we if, just move on. But if you look at your own experience, and, and this is where I feel like our discussion yesterday and for, for the audience, myself and Mary had a long discussion yesterday, which we'll talk about in time yeah. with people about having faith in the error. In fact, this weekend, we're going to do a seminar on that subject. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time, we, like you think about the first five years, you receive some divine love, but in the first five years of our relationship, you have wanted to hold on to your faith in error. You wanted to. Yes. You wanted to believe that it was pointless being love or loving. You wanted to believe that it was pointless engaging yourself yes. because you'd be harmed more. You wanted to believe that. Yeah. And because you wanted to believe that, no amount of love coming from you from an external source could shift you on that. You had to shift. I agree with that. <laughs> Again, I just feel like the feeling that I had is it's sort of like when you don't know the true nature of love, you can kid yourself that other thing, that some things you're doing are actually loving. I agree. And when you receive love from God, when I have received love from God, and I don't think we can, we don't, we shouldn't exaggerate how much love I feel I've received prior to the last year. You know, <laughs> I don't feel I received very much because I was very rebellious and having faith in error. But, but, but the love inside of you, you that you've already received in your argument should have been motivating you and making you more sensitive. But, but it didn't. It didn't make you more sensitive. So all the love you had, had received up to that point five years ago mm. hadn't made you more sensitive to this problem. So what made you more sensitive to the problem? Because it wasn't the love that shifted you. It wasn't receiving more love that shifted you. Mm. In fact, you okay. couldn't receive more love unless you shifted. You see, this yes. is, yes, this yes, is I how I see it. Yeah. We receive a certain amount of love, but then we use our will. And once we use our will in disharmony with that love, we cannot receive more of this love. And we are not going to become more sensitive as a result of receiving the love until we make the choice to acknowledge what the love is motivating us to do, what, where it's so pushing us. before we receive the love and then we receive love... We still receive the... Yeah, but does that shift create any sensitivity to the error that was already there? Not necessarily. So we have to release error before we can receive love? Of course. But <laughs> even receiving love... I've taught that all the way through. Yeah, no, no, sorry, I didn't finish my <laughs> sentence. Yeah. But even receiving love doesn't make us more sensitive to error. No. Mm. What makes us more sensitive to error is our will being used to be sensitive to the love we've received. Oh, man, that's what I feel like I was trying to say. <laughs> I just... I just so don't want this to be filmed. Anyway... <laughs> 
<laughs> but that, but, but it's, the, it's our will. We have, it's a, our will is the paramount thing. Not, but the, I, the love is not making you more sensitive. The will is going, how, where you use your will is what's going to make you more sensitive or not. And people have received divine love without being more sensitive yeah. at all yeah. in their life. And, and without being, you know, because they've used their will to suppress the effects of it. This is the power of our will. God's love is even directed by the power of our will. Mm -hmm. This is something that I feel most people do not understand at all. The power of the will is so great that even God allows it to control the effects of the love that we receive from God. Yeah, see, I, that's where I feel like I'm not communicating a sense that I have inside of myself. I'm... I'm not understanding it properly mm -hmm. because I do not disagree with that statement at all. Mm -hmm. Our will is paramount. We have to learn how to use it. Mm -hmm. But I feel but say I'm you've... experiencing something in relation to the love. Well, let's look at all the 14. Which is assisting me. Yeah, and that's why... Because that's a good example. I shouldn't be having this discussion <laughs> because I'm not like anyone else in this situation. No, but it, but it is like anyone else in this okay. situation. The good example is the 14 who have yet to make any choices to live in harmony with love. Yes. With God's love. They've received a certain amount of God's love, an immense amount of God's love. They couldn't even return to earth without having received a certain amount of divine love. Right? And yet they are using their will. Now that that love would normally create a, a an amazingly sensitive soul. And it has, in fact. I, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it has I created an amazingly I'm sensitive, soul. sensitive. I agree. And when I act in disharmony, when I use my will, which is my conscious decision, mm -hmm. in disharmony with the love I've received, I feel that the pain is exponentially greater than if I hadn't already had some divine love inside. Yeah, but look of me. what you've done with the pain. You've ignored it, tried to suppress it, use substances, use whatever to keep it under control. Absolutely. You've used your will to turn out the sensitivity. This is what I'm getting at. I was, yeah, okay. You've used your will to shut down the sensitivity. But when I use my will to, to tune in to what the love would tell me. Oh, ah, well, that's a different what... matter. Oh, <laughs> oh. I, okay. That's a different just, matter. Yeah, it's, I'm very sorry to all viewers because I didn't, get my feelings in words very well. Yeah, but, but that's a different matter completely. Well, this Could you talk to that point? Because yeah, that's because what I'm trying to You see, about. this is the power of our will. We must use our will in the right direction, in harmony with the love that we receive. And most people don't. The reality is most people don't, and that's why they do not receive more love, yeah. right? So, so what happens is the, the love we receive does have the effect of attempting to make our soul more sensitive. However, we can use our will to detune and suppress that sensitivity. We can increase our effort, in fact, to suppress the sensitivity. I feel that we must increase our effort because... We the, do, yeah. The, the, I agree. Like, once you've received some divine love and then to act in disharmony with it, there's like... It's like... Even if it, it's like the princess in the pea, if you're sleeping on a tiny bit of divine love and the rest of your life is total <laughs> sinful error, yeah. that bit of divine love is going to grate on you in terms of... It's going to grate on you, but... Not uh, in a nasty way. But, but is it going to be in a conscious way? Only if, if you use, you your, use will. your will. Yeah. It's a, and this is the problem, is that for most people, it's not... They're not using their will in a conscious manner to live in harmony with the love that they've received. And therefore, they finish up causing more damage to their soul. Yeah. As a result, so they might receive some divine love, and you can't eradicate divine love once it's received. Mm. But the problem is to suppress its changes in your soul. You've got to heavily use your will to keep it under control, and this is what most people do, and particularly most people in religious faith. This is what they do: they use the structure, the framework of their religious faith, to keep the divine love under control. Mm -hmm. And so, the divine love can't influence a change in their beliefs. It's only when they are willing to exercise their will in a completely different direction that they will become sensitive to the love they've received and therefore change their belief. And it is often a whole heap of group of emotions which are not about the love but about other problems. 
that cause us to exercise our will out of harmony with the love we receive. So what I'm trying to illustrate is, like, if you have, like, your biggest problem has always been fear. You know that, right? So you've heavily exercised your will against the love you've received because you've been terrified about what will happen if you do it. If I listen to what the love would dictate, definitely. Exactly, because God's love is already and has been dictating to you for most of your life a certain thing. That's what I was <laughs> trying to say, yeah. But, but it hasn't caused any change in you until you used your will. Yes, I see that, but... But I just felt that the, this is the gift that the love gives to us, is if we listen, if we are sensitive to what the love, like love brings with us, brings to us God's love, such a knowledge of what love is like and what love does, that if we were to be sensitive to that and build on that, even if it's just a small growth in awareness, if we use that to guide our actions, mm -hmm rather than fear, mm -hmm. which is the thing that stops us changing any belief systems, mm -hmm. then, then it's, like a, it's like the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. We know everything, you know. You know. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> See, I don't agree with that either. <laughs> well, if, if I use that as the basis to guide my actions and to ask for more love, then I get more. And then I get more and then I get more. And then in the end, I understand the secrets of the universe is what I'm trying to say. Mm, but if you use your will, like the reality is if you continue to use your will to suppress your fear, so you might be wanting, see, this is what I see happening with a lot of people. Yeah. They want more love, yeah. but they're not willing to address certain other problems. Yeah. Right. And what I'm saying to you quite clearly and to everyone is that if you're not willing to deal with the other problems, it's not gonna you're going to close down the reception of divine love. And it's going to be like the divine love isn't even in you in some cases. It's going to be like it's not even there yet. Yeah. Like because you're not allowing its influence. And this is where I feel like I feel there's, a, there's almost this concept among many people that as long as you receive the divine love, then, then it, it, it's sort of like this concept. Your soul will open when you receive divine love. And that's not true. No. The soul will open before you receive divine it love. It has to open in order to receive divine exactly. love. Exactly. And so if I am shut down in another area and I don't open that particular area, then I can't do it. I can't receive it. And I don't know why you're so hung up, babe. Yeah, I'm not. I'm just smiling because I, I need to. I think that I, I'm just totally mortified that I've just wasted everyone's time. No, but so let's it's a very on. important thing. I you, know. you do want to argue about this issue and you've got to look at why. Like what it is, what, you, what are you really trying to say? And I feel what you're trying to say is you're trying to imply that God's love when it enters you will make you more sensitive and you won't help but change. And I'm saying to you, no, that's not true. No, I actually, because I feel that I have received a lot of God's love, and it hasn't changed me until I decided to listen. I, and all I can do is this is the way I feel about it inside. I don't mm -hmm. know if I'm expressing it well. Mm -hmm. Until I decided to listen to what the love would dictate to me to do rather than the fear. Yes. That's and I agree the with that only completely. time I made any change. And I agree with that com statement completely yeah. now. It's not the same as the same as you no, made at the beginning. <laughs> exactly. And this is why I feel mortified, because if I just had have said that at the beginning, we but, wouldn't but have had this big segue and sideline. Yeah, but you see, these segues and sidelines are an indication of where your soul is on some issues. Absolutely. Because they, it wouldn't have happened otherwise. Yeah. And this is what I'm saying to people when we talk to them. These feelings that they have of resistance that go, which was a feeling you were having in, of resistance inside of you when we're having this discussion, you feel misunderstood, you don't feel like you're hurt, being heard, and all these different things. But I can feel in the soul this kind of concept that you want God's love to force your will and dictate what's going on without seeing the power of your will. And I don't feel, believe it's been until recently that you've actually seen the power of your will. Certainly not. And you it's know that you have a huge lesson for me about my will. I, yeah. I was never, I, I've never understood my will. Yeah. For 35 years I haven't understood my will at all and yeah. I'm just coming to understand it. The power of it. And I felt 
that this is a lesson I was learning about my will, which is that I had been using my will in disharmony with the love that I'd already received. And the results were very painful. Yes, but they didn't cause you to change. No, no. Until you chose. To change. To change. To act in harmony with what I was already... And not just that, you, you had given. to develop other qualities. You had to develop humility. That's the very first thing. You, you spent a lot of years, you know, since I've met you, developing humility. You've had to develop a desire for truth. Up until, up until when I met you, you had very little desire for truth. If, uh, and you also had to develop your faith, move your faith away from being a faith in the error. So you, you sort of had these faiths, didn't you? Massive. At the time of only believing in the, what the world believed in, you know, and the world was saying, you know, relationship with God is pointless, so you, you, that's all you had faith in. Really, yeah. the, tr- the feeling you had was relationship with God is pointless. And so you had a faith that relationship with God is pointless. And I just spent uh, two and a half years living in the Middle East where there's a lot of faith in violence, there's a lot of feelings of hopelessness, there's yeah. a lot of feelings that of injustice and the, the need, the feeling that... Um, Peace is utopian, basically. Yeah. And, yeah. and you also had this faith in um, the only way to change was to force change, wasn't it? There was that faith in... Or, to, or that change is not really or possible. Or change is not it's really Yeah, almost a at. faith in hopelessness. Yes, yeah, so that's is, what I had. Is what you had. That, that all you could do with your life is to try and be a good person, so at least you weren't adding to the crap. To the crap of the yeah. violence on <laughs> yeah. the planet, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so um, when I look at what you've done, I see substantial changes in a number of different areas before you were willing to work in harmony with the love you've received. Yeah, and and again, I feel very humbled in this situation. But um, perhaps that's my feeling. I have a feeling of... Um, impatience with myself now that if only five years ago I had have acted if I had have chosen and that's why I get so passionate in these Mm -hmm. discussions because I think if someone else could just learn this lesson all you got to do is is act in harmony with what the love's already shown you yeah but it's not that simple because all of those things I understand I probably it's it's just my impatience with myself for taking five years to reach this point yeah Um, but if you look at the immense changes you've had to make in that time You've had to learn humility coming from a family who, who seems to display very little <laughs> humility at all. You've had to learn a desire for truth again. Like, and, and you had a terrible fear of the truth that you had to let go of as a result of that. That takes time. These things take time. You can't do them like that. You can't just go, I'm going to work in harmony with love I've received when you've got all of these other particular things. And I sort of feel like you're being pretty hard on yourself like I feel the reality is that your example is, and, and a lot of it's been in public, is what the example that most people are going to have to follow. They, they are going to have to learn how to be humble. Because, like, honestly, as you know, there's people we've been listening to Divine Truth for the last five years who we still haven't, who still haven't worked through the humility problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we were talking to one of them this week. Yeah. And... Um, and they haven't even got to the desire for truth issue. And then you've had to work through the humility issue, the desire for truth issue, and also the faith issue, the faith in error as compared to the faith in truth, in God's truth. And then you had a desire to, to live in harmony with the love you've received. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I suppose I just feel a fought I fought so hard on every one of those points and it caused me and you and people a lot of pain yeah but um, I, I can't see how otherwise it could happen because the the will was already exercised in those particular areas in the opposite direction suppressing the effect of the love and so there was going to be a you know a fight with every one of those issues I can't I don't see unlike yourself I believe what you've done is exactly what you had to do. <laughs> like you sort of regret some of the choices and decisions you make in the last five years, whereas I sort of see them as, no, there's this issue of humility that had to be addressed, there's this issue of truth that had to be addressed, there's this issue of where your faith was that had to be addressed. And while you see that as no... 
you sort of still see that as no um, progress in that time, whereas I see that as immense progress in that time, and I see that what you've done is what everyone else who's ever listening to us has to do, and all of them believe they don't have to do it, most of them believe that, that they're not going to have to go through that process before they'll actually get to be receiving God's love again. And, and the reality is the majority of people are going to have to go through that exact same process. Where, and it's not just a simple thing of going, oh, I'm longing for the love, yeah, I'll get some. The reason why most people are not getting any is because they haven't gone through those processes that you've had to go through to awaken themselves to, this, to what's really going on. Yeah, and, and I don't think that that's why I said we shouldn't overestimate the amount of love I've received in the last five years because I really feel that when I was... No, I'm not overestimating that, but, I <laughs> am, but you have an immense amount of love that you received before we returned to Earth, but obviously also heavy suppression of the effects of that love on your life during this life. Yeah, I, I suppose what I was going to say was I, I don't think I could have just shown up and started asking for God's love with sincerity while I was acting in such disharmony towards humility. You can't. Yeah, yeah you and can't. rebelling against humility and truth. You can't. Um, and this is where I feel like it's one thing to say to people, look, all you have to do is long for the love. No, it's not all you're going to have to do. The reality is that the majority of us are completely blocked to longing for more love. We have these blockages, these false beliefs inside of us. We have a lack of humility. We have a lack of desire for truth. We have faith in all the things that are wrong and no faith in all the things that are right. And most of those things are going to have to start changing before we're going to be sensitive to, change, to, to actually being driven by the love we've received. And, and, and that's gonna, that is all about the exercise of our will. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Relax, darling. You're right. <laughs> Oh, I just feel you want like... to go away and have a cry and come back? Well, no, there's more that I could um, ask, talk, ask you about that. But that, again, is just my personal experience and I feel perhaps we should go back well, to the message. Well, we'll go back to the message, but one thing we want to say in this message is that myself and yourself have decided that we're going to talk about the integration of the four or five basic primary principles that a person must really understand if they're ever going to, to get closer to God. And that's the integration of the principles of humility, truth, faith and will and fear <laughs> and how all of those things interact with each other. And, and I feel that discussion is like we're going to have to spend months on that discussion <laughs> because it's like the majority of people still don't understand how much each one of those things affects their current decisions and, and, their, and their current choices in their lives, I feel. So I feel that we need to have a proper discussion about all those things. Yeah. Mm. Let's just pause for a moment. Um, do, you, do you guys have any questions about what we just I thought it was very good, even though... It was quite a difficult discussion, but I thought it was, you know, the difficulties Mary's having, the entire people have. Exactly. Like, I Everybody think... Everybody has. Yeah. One, one of the really important pe things for most people to be aware of is that Mary has been pretty open and honest yeah. about all of the things that she's been experiencing, right? And a lot of people, as a result of that, look down upon her. They do. Yeah. But the reality is... Every single person who wants to receive divine love is going to have to go through almost identical experiences. And, and you know, like I keep saying to Mary, that the whole concept that a person... What, we were, might have some love in her soul already, but we're not going to get any further with receiving more love. And this process of becoming one with God is all about receiving more love, right? It's all about progressing in love, not just receiving a little bit and then resting for the rest of your life on the fact that you've just received a little bit. It's about continuing to progress. And to continue to progress, if there's no humility, you won't progress. If there's no love for truth, you won't progress. If there's no love for or faith in the truth, you won't progress. 
If you have an unwillingness to face your fears, you won't progress. And if you, fo if you use your fears to, or you use addictions to cover your fears, you won't progress. Now, to, to deal with all of those issues, and uh, to exercise your will to deal with those issues, requires a force of will that is so intense in a lot of cases that the majority of people don't have the courage to engage it. <laughs> and, and Mary has had the courage to engage it, even given the circumstances of it being in public, being around me all the time, having a lot of other people criticise her and everything else, and she still had the will to engage it. That's the kind of will that every single person is going to need on the path to God. That's the kind of strength of will and character that they're going to need. And, and that's what this message is partially about, about the fact that many people receive a little bit of divine love in the beginning because they're so enthused and they really um, love the fact that, you know, that they've heard the truth and they feel that connection with God just initially. They receive a little bit of the love and everything. And there's the honeymoon period and it's over now. <laughs> and, and after this honeymoon period is over, now there's going to have to be an exercise of their will in some pretty straight, firm directions to focus on these areas before more love will be received. And it's that period of time when most people give up. That's the period of time when most people throw away the divine truth, when most people will say, like, I'm not going to have any more now. That's the period of time that it happens. And I've got all that on mute. Oh, you've got it. Sorry about that. And, and the important thing I feel is that people need to understand that, that, that there are things that block the flow of divine love into the soul, and it's all to do with the exercise of the will. It's all to do with how the will is actually used. And if people could understand that better, they would look at Mary's example as an example rather than being critical of it. They would look at it as an example. And as I said to Mary in the discussion privately, the reality is there are so many people around us who haven't even learned the first lesson of her example, which is the lesson of humility. There's so many. Like we're talking to, to some people this week and I've been listening to the divine truth for longer than Mary has, so nearly six years now, some of them, and they are still in the same place they were six years ago because they haven't learned the single lesson of humility yet even, like just a willingness to feel some emotion. They haven't even learnt that yet. They're just unwilling to feel some emotion and completely unwilling to see what addictions are covering their desire to not feel any emotion. And then they wonder why in six years they've heard all this truth but nothing's really changed in their life and nothing can change in their life because they have not engaged the very first principle of receiving more love and that is you need to be humble. You need to be sensitive to your own emotion. And... Uh, I just feel that for many people, if they, if they re-looked at Mary's life over the last six years, and there's now a video record of a lot of interactions between myself and her over that period of time, and they examined it, instead of examining it from a critical, you know, oh, where's Mary type of feeling that many of them had during that time, and they instead looked at it and going, okay, I need to copy what she's done. I need, to, I need to go back over what she's done and just look at what she's done. Because if, if I look at what she's done and I do what she's done, then I'll eventually work through these issues that she's had to work through that I actually have as well. But if they don't look at what she's done, it can be 10 years' time, they're still hearing all this material, but nothing will have changed in their life because they haven't done what she's done. What she has done is removed the blockages to receiving divine love again. That's what she's done. And that's what every single person who's ever received any divine love is going to have to do to continue receiving more divine love. They're going to have to remove the blockages that stop the reception. And that's what they're going to have to do. And that's what this message is all about. Removing, or partially about, because we wrote many messages about the, the problem of not receiving divine love anymore. And, and so... You know, this message is one of those messages in a series of messages that we, we talked about how a person needs to receive and remove the blockages to receiving divine love. So I sort of feel like it's a, it's a fantastic thing for people to see what the blockages of divine love Mary has had 
you know, like when I was just doing it by myself, nobody could see it because I, like I didn't have two video cameras on me 24 hours a day watching everything that I did, you know, <laughs> and somebody interviewing me about what I did and somebody telling me what's going on and all those kind of things. I had five years of life by myself working way, way through a lot of these issues and, and, I, and it was impossible to do them in public because nobody wanted to know me <laughs> during that time either. So I had to work through all of those things privately. And so very few people have got a personal example from my own life about how I worked through these same issues. But I had to work through humility. I had to work through having a desire for truth. I had to work through no longer having faith in the error and having faith in truth. I had to work through my fears and my addictions to covering over my fears. I had to do all of those things during that period of time, but nobody saw it. And, and, and I find it interesting that with Mary, people see it, but they don't do it. They don't copy it. <laughs> and they don't re they, in fact, they even criticise her for doing it or criticise where she's been during that time. And even Mary becomes self-critical of where she's been. And I'm going, no, no, no. There's no need to criticise all that because at the end of the day, every single person will have to do this. Every single person who's blocked to receiving divine love is going to have one of these problems. And they are going to have to address these problems before they'll receive more divine love. That's, that's the reality. Their faith in false beliefs is going to be a problem. Their inability to accept the truth is going to be a problem. Their inability to be humble to their own emotions, to actually allow the experience of their own emotions, that's going to be a problem. Their inability and lack of desire to use their will in harmony with God's laws is going to be a problem. Sooner or later, all of these problems will come to the fore. You can't continue to receive divine love without these problems coming to the fore and being eradicated from the soul. And, and I feel if, if people looked at what Mary has done over that period of time and go, okay, this is a really good, this is a really good sign of what I'm going to need to do. They could see that five or six years ago, Mary was angry. Okay, I can see there's me, you know, I've got all, I'm all, and all this lovely little facade, you know, not being angry with him, but I'm full of rage, you know, and, and, and I need to access it. I need to get at, and then Mary's had some addictions well, you're going to have lots of addictions to work through too. You're going to have to work through them and get to the point of acknowledging the fear that's underneath them and not honouring that fear anymore. You're going to have to get to the point and you're going to have to stop justifying the way in which you use your faith. You, instead of having faith in the way the world sees things, you're going to have to see things from God's perspective and you're going to have to have faith in the way God presents those particular things. You're going to need to. So... So that's going to be required of you. You're going to have to have a love for the truth in the end, no matter what, no matter what pressure you're under, no matter who's looking at you, no matter what happens. And you're going to have to have some humility to acknowledge and feeling all of those emotions if you want to receive more love. And I feel like if you copied Mary's example, you will go a great way towards doing all of those things. All I can do is talk about them because I've already done them before I met most of you. Mary is doing that while she's met you, so she can show you, by her example, show you what needs to happen. And I feel, I feel instead of criticising what happens, there is a deep need for people to have a really good, honest look at what's been happening, because if they do, they will find there it is, there's the pathway they're going to have to follow. All laid out to them. By example, that's how they're going to have to feel at some time or another. Do you think it's harder for Mary because she's in the spotlight? Or is it... um, certainly it's harder for Mary in the spotlight. Yeah, certainly. It's a, it's a lot harder because, because every single flaw that you have that you're removing at the time is, is you know, being highlighted by somebody. Whereas I had the chance to do all of that in privacy. Um, mind you, many of Mary's emotions won't come out of her without doing it in the spotlight. That's the reality. I, I had far less problem with um, public opinion than Mary had. I've always had people uh, have a poor opinion of me <laughs> throughout my life and, and I've had to deal with a lot of emotions of that. 
and Mary's lived a life that's been very different to me in that she's had generally people's good opinion of her most of her life. And so she's not ever been exposed to people's poor opinion of her until having public exposure. So there are certain emotions that Mary has that certainly will have to be addressed in the public. And, and I wouldn't have had to address them because I've already de dealt with them. But it is certainly much more difficult to address issues and have the courage and humility to address issues while you've got everybody criticising you. And that, that, that is a difficulty. And it's not even criticising Mary, people criticising Mary. A lot of people actually feel more connected to Mary than they do to myself. But Mary does, while in the past Mary saw that as a good thing, uh, nowadays she doesn't necessarily see that as a good thing because she sees that many times they want to do the same things she's done in the past that she now realises was an error, you know. So, um, you know, there are going to be things like that that happen as a result. But it is difficult, you know, doing what she does in, in, in the company of others. And also we're travelling a lot, you know, we're with people a lot. People get to see these particular things going on all the time. And I find a lot of people have a tendency then to look down upon her as a result. And they have got, those people who do have got no idea what's inside of them that they're going to have to address. And in fact, they'd be far better off, instead of looking down upon Mary, they'd be far better off ex copying her example. Yeah. yeah. And I'm perfectly happy for that to have been, in, that bit to be included in the video, I feel. You want to join us, baby? <clears throat> Just be yourself again, eh? Yeah. <clears throat> hold on, hold on. Don't you shut yourself down now that you're embarrassed. <laughs> 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 Just let me get that right yeah, okay. That's it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mary's joined us again, and uh, I've just, just for your <laughs> benefit, I've just been explaining to everybody how a lot of the things that you go through, they're going to have to go through. In fact, I feel and strongly believe that pretty much everything you go through, <laughs> they're going to have to go through at some point. And also, I've had to go through too. But, but the difference is, you know, I did it all by myself when nobody was interested in divine truth. Yeah. And so, of course, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing it when there's cameras involved or anything else, whereas you are. And I was talking about the difficulties of that as well. But I do feel strongly that everyone is going to have to go through this same process of removing these blockages to the reception of divine love. That's why we're talking about this yeah. message. Yeah. It's because it's so important. Yeah, and in a way, I think, as I said, maybe off camera to you earlier, like, I do have a lot of issues with... Is your uh, mute off? Yes. Yeah. I do have a lot of issues with public opinion, so, mm. you know, it's got to come out of me anyway, all these feelings I have of wanting to um, keep up a facade. And yeah, and I feel you have had 2,000 years of being treated pretty badly from the public opinion on earth. Yeah. And, uh, and I doubt whether there's been many people in human history that have had the same amount of negative public opinion as what you've had, um, and particularly associated with sexual issues. You know, there's probably no one who's had the same amount of public opinion what, as what you've had to deal with negatively in that regard. So, um, yeah, you know, I feel that this demo all it demonstrates to me, I feel, is your humility and courage rather than any other negative quality that you seem to. <laughs> Thank you, honey. I don't think I was that <laughs> humble before we stopped the camera. But That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> We are down to um, he, of course, in the first page of this <laughs> message. <laughs> okay. Shall I continue? Please do. <laughs> he, this is referring, of course, to the minister now. Yes. Uh, it, of course, is possessed of these beliefs because of his study and construction of some of the declarations of the Bible and therefore is not teaching what he does not believe or what it to his own conscience is false. Nevertheless, it is false. 
and he will have to suffer the consequences of such false beliefs and teachings. Mm. So there you're highlighting actually that there's implications to teaching there's implications to teaching untruth when we know it's untruth, but there's also implications when we teach untruth, even believing that it's truth. And there's also implications to believing untruth, even even though we think it's truth. <laughs> even when we don't teach it. <laughs> yeah, yes. that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, and there's an implication of the soul in each one of those things. And the implication, of course, is it does affect the way in which we use our will and therefore suppresses uh, the way in which we suppress our soul. And if we suppress our soul and we use our will to suppress our soul in a certain direction, of course the end result is going to be that we cannot receive divine love. That's one of the conditions under which we cannot receive divine love. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I said ignorance, while it will not relieve him from its consequences and neither will it invoke the penalties of the law that apply to the willful deceiver or teacher of false doctrines, Yet neither will it excuse him or relieve him from the penalties of the law that demands the truth and only the truth to be believed and taught. He will have to get rid of these false beliefs, even though he may have some of the divine in his soul. For whenever there exists untruth in belief in the heart and soul of man, to that extent it interferes with the inflowing of the love into and the progress of the soul towards perfect unity with the Father. So here, here I'm trying to illustrate the effect of error in the soul. Mm. And, and one of the things I've been saying quite frequently in our discussions with people is it, unless you are willing to feel the error of the soul, remember the errors that are in the soul are all to do with feelings underlying these errors. Unless you're willing to feel the errors of the soul, they will not be released from you. And no matter how much intellectually you even accept the truth, the errors will still dictate your, your attractions. It will still dictate whether you can receive divine love or not. Mm. So, so even if this man decided that he was now in truth intellectually about a certain belief, unless he released the error in his soul that wanted him to believe that untruth, mm -hmm. he will still not be able to receive divine love. And is that what you're referring to in the sentence here where it says, um, well, when you talk about the law which demands the truth, mm. that is the law that dictates our receiving divine love? Yes. Yeah. There, obviously, there is a large number of laws surrounding the law of divine love. So we could call the law of divine love like a family of laws. <laughs> and one of those laws of divine love um, which are involved in the reception of divine love is this demand. That is, there is a law that demands the truth. And when I say demand, I mean demand. <laughs> it, it, the way God's created it is that you must. It's a must. And, and any person who doesn't uh, um, bring their will into harmony with the demand for truth in terms of the universal law will never become at one with God. Uh, and, and that... It doesn't matter whether they believe it's true. What matters is whether it is true. Mm. That's what matters. So the problem on the earth is that there are many constructions of so-called truths that are not true. And everybody believes they're true, but they're still not true. Mm. And the law, God's law, demands that it's actually the absolute truth that, that is brought into being. And every time we contradict that law, there is obviously subsequent penalty on our soul and the souls of others. And, the, and there is, as I said there, there is, there is resultant pain and suffering mm. as a result of that law not being adhered to. Mm. And if you look at the, the world today, you can see so much pain and suffering as a result of truth not being spoken, said, covered over, being manipulated. It's terrible the amount of, and this is why I am so hot on it <laughs> with everybody. Um, and even in my own life, so hot on it because, because without it, uh, there are firstly laws that you break and you cannot maintain a relationship with God while those laws are broken. But, but also without it, there's a lot of harm and su suffering and pain that results not only to yourself but to other people who imbibe the truth or the lack of it that you distribute to others, even if you do it with a good motive. Yeah. Like, so there are many religious people in the past who've had a good motive to share what they believed to truth to be with others 
but it, it still has a penalty because it, untruth always has its penalty. So you just think of the one untruth in the Christian faith about a hellfire. That has terrible, terrible consequences of suffering upon people who pass over into the spirit world and even upon people who are not even passed yet who are afraid of <laughs> passing as a result of the, of the yeah. doctrine. People cling to life for a long time. They hang on the yeah. life for like... For grim death, is it? <laughs> like, you know, they hang on, hang on, hang on, like they hang on with, 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 you know, their fingernails into life because they're so afraid to pass because they feel that they've not been necessarily a good person and as a result of that, they're probably going to end up in one of these hells or they don't even know where they're going to end up. And as a result of that, they're, they're you know, they'll, they'll, they'll endure sicknesses and other things for long periods of time with medication and everything keeping them alive, body parts being ripped mm. out of them. All sorts, they, even now, what do we do? We even have preemptive surgeries taking away body parts that might get sick in some yeah. point in the future. Yeah. That's how far we've gone with our fear of death. Mm. Whoa, you know? And that's all because we've been taught something all, that's not true. All because we're taught something not true. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very sad situation. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, mm. let's continue. Mm. So I've said truth is of itself a fact. It can have, and I might add that it's God's fact. <laughs> <laughs> it can have no affiliation with untruth, no matter that untruth is the result of ignorance. For all untruth is the result of ignorance <laughs> and must be eradicated from the hearts of men before there can be that harmony between God and man which the very nature of truth itself requires. And this is a very important point, mm -hmm. I think, even uh, uh, that whether the truth is a result of ignorance or not, at the end of the day, it has damaging effects. So whether we, whether we are believing something that's not true uh, in ignorance or preaching something that's not true in ignorance yeah. or whether we're doing it in, on, purpose. on purpose, but even the fact that we have untruth that we think is truth, it's still as a result of some ignorance. Ignorance, some other ignorance. Some other ignorance, exactly. isn't it? Yeah, yeah obviously. Yeah. And, and the very nature of having a pure and completed connection with God requires truth. Yeah. W without this underlying principle, we, you know, I, I feel for so many people who come along to our seminars because they still do not get the importance of truth in their life. They still can't even tell their husband or wife the truth, let alone, you know, live in truth with God or themselves. And, and unfortunately, it has its penalties yeah. every single time. And it's like a lot of people who say to me, oh, I've been longing for God's love and I'm not receiving it. And, and there, there has to be a point of where we admit the truth to ourselves that actually maybe this isn't longing. Well, <laughs> you know, it, it, maybe this is something else, an addictive desire that I'm wanting to have met or maybe there's... Yeah, well, it sorry. could be that, but it could also be those things we mentioned earlier yes. and that is we're not humble. We're not yeah. humble to our emotions. It could be that we don't have a longing for truth. Mm -hmm. It could be that we have faith in the error and we want to hold on to the error. Sure. It could be that we want to use our will out of harmony with law. It yeah. could be any one of these things yes. that prevent us. So we might have a sincere longing for the love but God's telling us by not giving us the love, he's telling us, no, you've got a problem in one of these other yeah. areas and unless you sort out that problem, the love ain't going to come, you know. <laughs> That's the law because the love itself has laws that govern its flow. Mm. And I feel this is something that people don't understand very well, that, that the way God's designed his love is that there are laws that govern its flow. And, and a lot of people are confused about that. Like they think, why is there laws that govern it flows? They, oh, well, I ask love, they should just get it under all circumstances. And that's not really how life really is generally, but that's how they want it to be. They want to be able to receive love even though they're being wicked or mm -hmm. they want to receive love even though they're being resistive or they want to receive love even though they're shut down to their feelings. <laughs> you know, and none of those things are possible because the, the law of love says none of those things can happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so that if no man could be a son of God who has not the perfect harmony which truth absolutely demands, God would have no sons amongst men. <laughs> the condition of the sinner and that of the man who has experienced a new birth differs only in the fact that one has not commenced to have his, in his soul the essence of truth, while the other, to an extent, has that essence. Mm -hmm. 
All may have that essence to, and to great abundance. Some may never have the essence of divine truth. Yet no man will be left without the essence of truth which leads to the perfect man. So in other words, here I'm even saying that even to just get to the perfect man, you're going to have to come to accept some truth at some point. <laughs> you know, um, if you want to become perfect with God, then you're going to have to accept a lot more of God's truth by the time you hit that point. But the reality is God is basically the owner of all truth in the universe. Divine truth is God's truth. It's God's absolute truth. All we are doing is discovering it. That's all we're trying to do or attempting to do. And, and to have a relationship with God, we're going to have to be perfected in its discovery. Mm. Not, not in its completion, but in its discovery. We have to want it all the time. To become the perfect natural man, we have to want it enough to become the perfect natural man. If we don't want the truth enough to become the perfect natural man, we will be in one of the lower spheres, not progressing, for as long as it takes for us to come to that realisation. If we um, want to become at one with God, we're going to have to have this continual feeling, I want more truth, I want more truth, I want more truth, and become eventually at one with God in this desire to receive all of God's truth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just find too that in this message, um, I like what I said here, <laughs> and I've said it many times in this life. The yep. condition of the sinner and that of the man who has experienced the new birth differs only in the fact that one has not commenced to have in his soul the essence of truth. Yeah. Yep. And I see that as a major problem for many people who come to our seminars. Mm. Many people who come to seminars have yet to have the essence of truth in their soul, the, the feeling that they want truth under all circumstances. And that's, uh, yeah, as you've mentioned, like a lot of us are afraid of truth. We want to rebel at truth. We think truth isn't fair. We, you know, there's so many things there's to work through emotion, emotionally yep. Yep. to actually welcome truth from our hearts, mm. isn't there? A feeling that truth will be held against us, that we'll be punished with truth. Like all of these things are actually emotions that I have worked through mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in the last few years. Exactly. To, to then grow within me this feeling... And to have some experiences with truth, which actually teach me the opposite. Yep. Truth equals freedom. Truth equals healing. Truth equals... It might, you know, I might experience some pain, but beyond that, there's more joy. Yep. But initially, a lot of people don't have those feelings about truth, do no. they? Yeah. No, not at all. Yeah. And, and they're going to have to have if they really ever <laughs> want a sincere relationship with God. Yeah. And in fact, a relationship with God's not possible without it. Yeah. And even becoming the perfect natural man is not possible without a lot of truth. Which is very interesting in itself, yeah. isn't it? It's yeah. a beautiful thing, really, that God's done because God's basically saying to us, you are going to have to, at some point in your future, develop a desire for truth before mm -hmm. you can even get out of the condition you're currently you're in. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I, li I love that, how, how beautiful that is as a design yeah. because, it, because it means that at some point every single person who ever progresses is going to have to have a pure desire for more truth. Yeah, and the power of the statement that you just read out, the condition of the sinner and that of the man who has experienced the new birth. That's... So there's like a very large gap <laughs> of seven spheres. Yes. Right? differs only in the fact that one has commenced to have in his soul the essence of truth. Exactly. So really also that statement is telling me that one of the key issues, the antidote to sin, is actually being willing to embrace truth. Yeah, and that makes sense when you think about it Absolutely. because um, sin is the creation of all of our fear. And, and fear is the false appearing real to us. You know, we're always afraid of something. And, and it's the fear, the, the antidote to fear is yeah. always truth. Yeah. So, so of course it makes sense that the antidote to sin is going to be truth, truth. as well. Yeah. yeah. But it's not going to be a truth that we've intellectually imbibed. It's going to be something that we have to feel. It's got to be a feeling. And in fact, all of these emotions, all of these things or, or substances we're talking about, truth, humility, you know, uh, faith, they are all feelings based on the soul that will drive us. Even the use of our will is a feeling, is a feeling and desire that comes from our soul. And, and I love that you've said in this statement that it's, it's 
to have in his soul the essence of truth. It's nothing intellectual. It's a soul, soul based, based feeling. thing. And to do that, we have to open our soul to truth, don't we, to receive it in yeah. there. Yeah. Well, it's also about our soul is a lot about our loves and affections, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We've got to have an affection for truth. <laughs> yes. It's probably a, yearning, a, great, it a yearning like, yes. and affection for it. And I feel what I see very frequently still is people are terrified of it, <laughs> terrified <laughs> of the truth. And, and it's only when you transform from being terrified of truth into having an affection for truth that you actually also become more humble in many cases because, um, you know, it's often our terror of truth that causes us to block it, to block it, to block it, to shut it down. And it's our terror of the emotional experience of truth that causes us to shut down our emotional experience. And so if you think about it, Unless, the tr unless we have this love of truth, it's going to be very, very difficult mm. for us to make any progression either on the natural love path or the divine love path, mm. actually. Mm. And so any form of progression on this planet begins to a degree with the uh, desire for truth, more truth. And if you think about it, that is even true scientifically. Like, mm. Unless we want more truth scientifically, we're not going to receive more scientific facts. <laughs> yeah. Quite simple. Yeah. And unless somebody searches for it and discovers it, there's not going to be the reception of it. I was thinking this morning um, about um, the similarity between truth and social security. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and what, I, what, I, what I thought of is that in a lot of these Western countries where there is social benefits, uh, if a person's given benefits without there being any work for it, Generally, what happens is they develop an expectation and they don't appreciate mm -hmm. any of what they receive as a result. Mm -hmm. And in a way, truth is like that. God doesn't give us truth because God doesn't want us to get to the point where we don't appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> and the only way we're really going to appreciate it is if we work for it, if we have to do something to, to actually receive it and, uh, and, have a, and in particular have a desire, desire to receive yeah. it. And, and the whole, I, I sort of feel it's the same between this sort of social security benefits and truth. If you give it on a platter, people don't appreciate it. Mm. If you give it when it's desired, people appreciate it. People, yeah. people really appreciate it then. And, uh, and it's very, like I feel this is a major thing that we need to understand about the soul itself. The soul that is seeking is the one who appreciates what it receives. Yeah, it, well, it's the only one who actually receives, isn't mm. it? And we base a lot of our lifestyle on that principle, really, don't we? We, mm -hmm. we give talks to people who have asked us. We, exactly. When we find there's not a desire for then a certain thing, then we don't thing, feel like doing we just it very don't much. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> and also I find if people don't have a desire for truth, there's little point discussing it with them. Well, they, it doesn't make any impact yeah. on them. And the only reason for a person to come to a talk when their heart is closed to truth is to have an addiction met. And mm. if we're fostering an addiction in someone, yeah. it's very damaging actually, isn't it? Yeah, last week I, I did a whole series of interviews, as you know, and, and, uh, and one of the interviews was interesting. It was, it was the only one from the USA and it was a Christian radio station. And, and it was very, very interesting because the only reason why they wanted to interview me was to abuse me. And so what they did was they rang me up and from the moment that they started talking, I didn't get to say anything. So I listened for about 15 minutes, this man, uh, this Christian man, quoting all of these Bible verses, misapplying all of them, of course, and, uh, and, and for 15 minutes, he never, he was just accusing me of one thing after another thing, of the other thing after the other thing, quoting all these Bible verses and just kept on going. And, and I started to answer and he, he just kept talking, so I just let him keep talking. And around, after about 15 minutes of this, I just said to him, look, you don't want to receive any answers, so I'm hanging up. <laughs> and I hang up. And I find that's the way a lot of people are who believe they have the truth. Mm. They, they often are full of error, but they don't want to hear anything different. They don't want to hear anything different than what they already believe. Yeah. And it's impossible to share anything with them, impossible to share any truth with them mm. as a result. Mm. Mm. The truth of the angel existence and the truth of the perfect man are equally truths, though the former is of a higher degree in nature than the latter. It says other, but I said latter. 
-hmm. Our first parents were the children of God, his own creatures, good and perfect. And after their fall, they became no less his children. For his love was so great for them that in the fullness of perfection of his plans, he again bestowed upon them the privilege of receiving his divine love and sent me to proclaim the fact and to show men the way to obtain that great love. So here I'm now talking about uh, what happened in the original instance. The original instance was uh, Ammon and a man were in perfect truth, not completely in harmony with all of God's truth at this point, but they were in the perfect truth of the perfect man. Mm. In their fall, they became sinners. They became people who acted out of harmony with love. God never withdrew his love. It just couldn't flow into them anymore. And, God, and so God waited for an opportunity, basically, in, in order to re-bestow this gift, in order to show people that this gift was available. And when I came to earth and had such a strong desire to understand truth and humility and love and receive God's love and connect with God... That was God's opening, if you like, of being able to have somebody on earth who could show this and demonstrate this love and its power and, and the ability for anybody on earth to receive it. And that's the only reason why I became the so-called Messiah. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't because, you know, God selected me out of the billions of people to do it. It was because I saw the opportunity and I took it. And I and I wanted to do that because I wanted to have the relationship with God. Yeah. And there is, it's very important that people understand that the only reason why God could do that was somebody wanted to. Yeah. Somebody wanted to be humble. Somebody wanted to know the truth. Somebody wanted to have faith, not in the error, but in God. Somebody wanted to use their will for the first time in many, many millennia that somebody wanted to use their will in a different direction. Mm. And... And that's the reason why I received the truth to the point of it one with God and was the first person to do so. It's just like, I sort of see it as just like, you know, the people who, do, who have came up with flight, it was their desire that drove them to receive that truth. The people who became up with rocket science, well, they, it was their desire to <laughs> have received that truth. The people who, you know, look, look at all these new inventions, the medical profession and all the new discoveries it makes, they only make it because somebody wanted to find out yeah. the truth. And in my case, I wanted to find out the truth about God. Mm. That's the only difference. I wasn't focused on these other physical matters. Yeah. And, and really, in your statement, you're saying that God loves his children so much that he, he didn't ever withdraw that opportunity even once it was rejected. Exactly. And but once it was rejected, there was like the death of the soul. The death of the soul had, had occurred then. And what I meant by that when I said that in the first century is the soul had died to its potential of receiving divine love. Mm -hmm. So it was like it had died, even though the soul was still alive. It figuratively had died. And when I talked about the resurrection, I was talking about the resurrection of the soul from that death state of, no, of not having the potential to receive divine love to now having the potential again to receive divine love. Mm -hmm. And that was the resurrection I was mm. speaking of. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay, so the death, now I'll talk about, about that. The yeah. death that had existed for all the long centuries was supplanted by life potential. And I became the way, the truth and the life and immortality became a possibility to men. And I should say a possibility again to men. Mm. Mm. So that all men are the sons of God in relation, in one relation or the other. So in other words, they're either a son of God in the relationship that they've, they've always been a son of God, mm -hmm. or they're a son of God now with this you know, divine potential. They've become the divine son of God, which is a different son of God, if you like. That's what I call being born again. Yeah. So, so one way or the other, we are still sons of God. Yes. Right. And so when, when I get rang up uh, and interviewed with these people that say, you're saying you're the son of God? Yes, I am. And, uh, and you are too. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they, they seem to skip over that one. They keep saying, but you're saying you're the son of God? I say, yes, I am, but you are too. <laughs> and it's quite amu amusing, yeah. isn't it? And also there is that, isn't there, that even, <laughs> even you as the son of of God in the secondary sense. In the redeemed sense. sense. Yes. In the yeah, born again sense. It, it's, a, it's a potentiality for everyone anyway. Exactly. So we can all be 
sons and daughters. Uh, we all are primarily yes. and we can all become sons and daughters in this other sense. Well, in our way, our soul is literally the son of God yes. or the daughter of God. But uh, once we become born again, our divine soul is now literally a, a, a divine son of God or a son, divine daughter of God. We've now just been transformed. Our, our, you could say our sonship, our, our daughtership has been transformed into divinity. It, it's been transformed. It hasn't been given. It's a, it's a, we still were a son of God or a daughter of God before we began. Yeah. But the way in which we're a son or a daughter of God has now doubled, or even more than that, I feel. But we, we have gone from being a literal son or daughter of God into not only being a literal son or daughter of God, but being a son or daughter in love as well, mm. which, is, which is completely different and also a much more powerful mm. experience. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so um, where am I? Oh, yes. So that all men are the sons of God in one relation or the other, depending in the one case whether a man will turn from his sins and be satisfied with the protection of his natural love, perfection, sorry, of his natural love and the home that belongs to the perfect man, or seeks the inflowing into his soul, the divine love, which will enable him to enter the divine heavens and have the certainty of immortality. So one way or the other, we are going to be sons of God. Even if we don't feel we're going to be a son of God, we're still a son of God. <laughs> <Actually>. <laughs> when God re-bestowed this divine love on man, there was no man in existence or in spirit either who could be called his son if it were necessary that he had been converted as the preacher said. Because none had received this love, which was the only thing or power in all God's universe that can convert a man dead in trespass and sin. Yet God loved all his children and conferred upon them his, this great gift because they were his children. If God had loved only the righteous, there would have been no one who could have been the object of his bounty. He would have no sons or children of his love. And this is a big flaw with that Christian doctrine. The idea or concept that God is only the God of the righteous and, and only the righteous are God's sons, is totally impossible. Because all of us at some point were sin, sinners after the first Ammon and man sin. And then since then, without the recovery and God offering love to somebody who's a sinner, mm -hmm. it was impossible for anybody to become children of his love. And so this whole concept that we are only children through the blood sacrifice of Jesus or some other concept, they're all so much in error for many, many logical reasons. Yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. Do you want to? No, go, no. Ahead. go ahead. And now that he has re-bestowed this gift and some of the sons of men have received and possess it and are more in harmony with him, it is not true that those who were his sons and children before its bestowal are any less his sons and children because they may not have sought and made this gift their own. Yeah. No, the Father's love is so great and so broad and deep that it goes out to all the children of earth, waiting to bestow it upon them. And the lost sheep is as much his child as the ninety and nine who are safe in the fold. And although the lost one may never find or enter the fold, where those are that possess this divine love are sheltered, yet that sheep remains and is the object of his love. Yeah, and that's very beautiful. I think that's referring to a passage in Luke, um, which talks about the one God still, or uh, why don't I find it? Well, it talks about a sheep where, where, where a man loses one sheep and he goes off in search of it and he leaves the 99 in order to go and search for it. Yes. It's one of the illustrations that I gave in the first century before I met you, actually, yeah. um, in, in order to try to demonstrate God's care for anyone that is lost. Yes. Mm. So, then Jesus told them mm -hmm. in, in this parable, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. 
I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot about will, isn't it? About a person coming to use their will. Yeah, and it's also about how God sees the humility. See, repentance is an act of humility. Mm. And, and when a person is not repenting, they are in a state of arrogance. And when, while they're in a state of arrogance, there, it's impossible to give them truth. It's impossible to give them love. It's impossible for them to actually change. And so this is why people who are already humble, already receiving truth, it's really beautiful they're doing all that. But when, when spirits in the spirit world see that one person who was arrogant now become humble, there's this great like joy. Yes, <laughs> they've a made result, a different choice. They've made a yeah. different choice. And now there's so much love they can receive. There's so much truth they receive. There's so much change that's going to happen in their life after that point. And so there's just a huge reaction to, the, to that, like, as, it, as the Bible quoted it there, the sinner that uh, that becomes a person who's now repentant yeah. and and it's a beautiful thing in fact god is attracted to such people mm. god's attracted to the heart, uh, to the humble heart mm. as a result of and that. but you're saying here even even when that one person doesn't make that choice mm-hmm. god is still loving god still loves them yeah. even if they don't do that yeah. and that's very very important mm. to understand and i feel that's if you look at most religious faiths and most teachings, there is this implication in most religious faiths and teachings that that's not true. Yeah. Um, that, that, and in fact, um, when you look at some of what the, what the Bible foretells will happen in the future, which is God will come and destroy the wicked, it's really suggesting that God is angry with yeah. the people who don't, who don't uh, right. do what he yes. wants, basically. Yes. Which is really, again, another contradictory thing because... On one hand, God gives us free will, and then God's angry when we use it out of harmony with how God wants us to use it. Then why did God give us free will in the first place? Well, might as well made us all robots (laughs) if that was the case. There are not many much. There's not much logic in a lot of these belief systems. God is love, and love knows no limitations. Sorry, honey, you've missed a paragraph. So let preachers. So let preachers and others who have assumed the responsibility of teaching men the truths of the Father. Cease from proclaiming the doctrine that only those who have received the new birth are the sons of God. They, of course, are not his obedient sons until they have obtained either the divine love and the essence of the Father or the purity of the first parents before the fall, but yet they are his, even though defiled by their own creations of sin and error. And notice here again I point out, as we have done in many other messages, that sin and error are our own creations. We cannot attribute them to God. Mm. And God also is not going to get rid of them through some magical means. They are our own creations. We are the ones who are going to have to destroy the results of them. Mm. Um, And, of course, that makes sense if you think about it. Mm. God is love and love knows no limitation in its heights or depths. It exists in the highest heavens and reaches to the lowest hells and will in its own way and its own time work its own fulfilment. All men will come into harmony with the will of the Father, which is perfect. And even though some, and I may say the majority of men, will not accept the invitation to become angels of his celestial kingdom, which is not compulsory, yet they do his will by becoming in the future, near or far, free from sin and error of their own creation and pure and perfect as they as were they whom the father first created and pronounced good so a lot in this paragraph that i love Mm -hmm. about um the fact that love knows limitations in its heights or depths Mm -hmm. that it exists in the highest heavens and reaches to the lowest hells Mm -hmm. and will in its own way and its own time work its own fulfillment Mm -hmm. To me, that statement says a lot about love's power over evil, how mm-hmm. love governs the universe that mm-hmm. we live in. Yep. And so that in time, love is going to work, have its own fulfilment in every, everywhere that it exists, which is everywhere. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. and, and one fulfilment is that people become the perfect natural man because mm-hmm. they don't, it's not compulsory that they become perfect. angels, yes. that they, that that they, they receive God. divine love. Yeah. Yeah. It's not compulsory that they have a... And this is a part of the expression of the beauty of God's love too. Yes. God loves us so much that we're not 
we're not compelled to have a relationship with God. That How many parents on earth have that attitude towards their children? Exactly. And also, God loves us so much that even though we are not got a relationship with God, God wants us to have a happy life. God provides for us. And how many parents want that for their children? Like how many children go, yeah, mum and dad, I don't love you anymore. And (laughs) mum and dad go, no worries, here's another (laughs) 50,000 to help you out with your life. You know what I mean? (laughs) Most parents would never do that. They go, oh, look at all the things I've given you. Let me take some of them away. (laughs) Yes, especially (laughs) my approval. Especially my approval. Yeah. 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 So, you know, God's love is far more pure and powerful Mm. than any person's expression of love on earth unless they have God's love in their soul. And and we need to understand that, you know. Mm. But also I feel it's important that the 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 gift of divine love is an invitation that God has given us. It's not God's not going, you must receive my love and if you don't receive my love, and this is really what the Christian religious faith tends to tends to suggest to most people. If you don't receive my love and you don't do what I ask you to do, you're dead. You're <laughs> yeah. gonna you're you're gonna be thrown Eternal into damnation. yeah. You're gonna be thrown into Gehenna, mm. the, the everlasting fire. You know, along with the devil and all of his demons who will also go there and be with you. And you'll be you know. There's even this implication in some of the Christian faiths that they're going to be tortured forever in that place. Wow. Like how much of a contrast in love is that? that, That's the kind of resentment that people on earth have, I agree. You Mm. know, this everlasting resentment that seems to be there sometimes. But but I suggest even in the long run, most people let go of that. Yes. (laughs) And to suggest that God has it is to Mm. suggest that God is worse than the very worst of mankind. And this is a, a terrible teaching, you know, and like I said in the paragraph above, the preachers and others who assume the responsibility of teaching these truths about the Father, they are in so great an error, they do not understand what they're doing. And in fact, in the next paragraph, I think, I say, yeah, man's greatest enemy to man is he who, having received the assurance of possessing the divine love and thereby becoming, as it were, a divine son of the Father and who believes in the errors of the Bible and the misinterpretations of its truths, declares that all others of mankind are hated of God and are objects of his wrath and certain of eternal damnation and everlasting torment. Mm. Notice I said man's greatest enemy to man is he who Mm. does that. Mm. And I feel that is the truth. You are far better off not having any teaching whatsoever (laughs) than actually having that. And also it, it creates so much damage, not only now but also in the spirit world, that teaching. And it causes so much alienation from God. It causes so much distress. It causes so much hopelessness, both here on earth and in the spirit world. It, uh, it destroys people's concept of God mm-hmm. and it destroys people's humanity as mm-hmm. well, by the way. Because even those people who perhaps don't lead a particularly sinful life, mm-hmm. um, but who have a belief in hell and the devil and all of these really dark realms that mm. they're eternal damn there's an eternal damnation for people who do sin mm. they've essentially misunderstood god's true nature and so they mm. are far away from god mm. even if they have like a pretty clear you know they have some love within them even mm. if they have some divine love within them mm. they're still a long they're way from understanding will. god's nature aren't they well they're using their will to set themselves up as god's enemy mm. really that's what mm. they're doing and like like i need to say that again i feel mm. man's greatest enemy to man is he who does that the who, person who, who's received some divine love and then goes about preaching that yeah you're not saved if you don't Yeah, it's a terrible thing to do. And it's also terrible for one other reason, and that is because they've received some divine love, the other person's soul can feel that they've received some divine love, and therefore the other person's soul automatically tends to assume that what they're stating to them is true. And it's just very, very damaging, such a damaging thing to do. And there are many people still living in the hills who have done this, by the way, who have taught this doctrine which is a very blasphemous doctrine towards God, but also very blasphemous, uh, also very damaging to themselves and to others. That's why it has such strong penalties, mm. because it's so against love mm. that it has such big penalties. 
Yeah, and really a big theme in this message is, isn't it, about how the repercussions for teaching error. Yes, yeah. yeah, very much so. It is deplorable that such beliefs and such declarations should exist and continue to be made, especially on the part of those who undertake to lead the masses in the way to God's truths and plans for men's happiness and redemption from evils and sins that cause them so much suffering. So it's especially bad that it's the people who claim that they are leading people to God's truth who make such terrible declarations and deplorable declarations about God and about God's universe and about God's laws and about God's nature. And also, like I do feel quite strongly that it is, a man, a per, it is man's greatest enemy having a person who has a religious faith mm -hmm. who then believes that they can attack other people and pull down other people and tell them that they are going to be killed as a result of not having such faith. Yeah. It is a terrible, terrible thing that they do. It's terrible in a lot of ways, isn't it? Because they're, they're saying, I know God and I know what God's going to do to you. And that, that's so damaging for the person on the receiving end of it, isn't of it? Of course, and you can see why so many people on the receiving end get angry yes. <laughs> about yeah. it. It's and why a... there is a lot of angry atheists on the planet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Last week during an interview, the best discussion I had, through, we did some talkback radio last week in Ireland, and the best discussion I had was with an atheist. You know, he asked me some questions, I gave him some straight answers, he asked me another question, gave him an answer. He goes, okay, that yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Whereas the discussions I had with the Christians, all they did was they bombarded me with their errors, like, and they treated me as their enemy, mm. as they, many of them do. And in the end, also declared a lot of things about God, like that God was going to come and just, they, they were saying to me that I would come and just, I'm not Jesus because I, I, Jesus will come and destroy the wicked when he comes yeah. and everyone will know. And I'm going, and, I'm, and, I, and I didn't even get a chance in many cases to give an answer. That's how dogmatic mm -hmm. and uh, unwilling they were to receive any truth about mm -hmm. the matter. And there's an example of man's greatest enemy to man. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of person. Yeah. Mm. But all this shows the power and blindness of belief founded upon error and untruthful teachings. And strange as it may seem, these leaders of the ignorant may have some divine love in their souls. And yet their mental and intellectual beliefs be so fixed and unmovable that the possession of this love will not cause them to understand that the Father's love is for all and that wrath is not a part of his being but a quality of sinful man that these believers in error attribute to him. Mm. If God may be said to hate anything, he hates sin, but he loves the sinner who is the creature of his will and who is so unfortunate as to have created that which defiles him and to wander away not only from the Father but from his own perfect and pure creation. Can we, can we uh, talk about this statement that God hates sin? Because I... I said it, uh, I, I was again quoting the Bible here because mm. the, the Bible um, does have a statement in it that says that God hates sin. Mm. And the reality is that um, the, the, the emotion of hate does not exist in God. Mm. Um, so, so the best thing you could say is that God does not love sin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that God is not attracted to sin, does, that God doesn't endorse sin or respond to sin. And God does not love sin. No. No. And, and in fact, um, you know, God sees the damaging effects of sin, of mm. course. Now, when I say, said here in the message that, uh, you know, it may be said that if God hates anything, and like I said, if God hates anything, yeah. um, I was implying that God doesn't hate anything already. Mm. He hates sin to the extent that, he, you know, that, it, that he loves a sinner, but he, but he doesn't love the fact that the person take, makes the unfortunate sin. choice. To, to do the sin that, that defiles him. And th this was really just a direct quotation that I was taking out of the Bible, a, a, a quotation that Paget himself would, was, was aware, aware of. of yeah. And in terms of helping Paget see that, that we need to separate the sin from the sinner. Mm -hmm. You see, I don't even sort of see the sinner as the sinner even. I just see them as a perfect creature of God who's imbibed sin, mm. who's imbibed the effects of acting out of harmony with love. And that's how God sees them as well. And um, obviously, if you think of the sin 
the sin is anything acting out of harmony with love. So, of course, God is not going to agree with any action taken out of harmony with love or any feeling taken out of harmony with love, any thought taken out of harmony with love. Mm. Of course, God does not agree with those things. But God doesn't have a wrathful feeling about those things. If God did, I would suggest that everyone who's currently alive on the planet would now be dead if God yes. had a <laughs> wrathful feeling about the sinner, yeah. the sin yeah. as well, and felt that the sinner had imbibed the sin uh, to such an extent that it couldn't be redeemed, then God would basically already be in a wrathful state and all of us would be gone. So there'd be, uh, this planet would be empty of yeah. human life if that was the case. Yeah. And obviously that's not the case. No. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> So then I say, well, I've written enough for tonight and I hope that what I have said may prove beneficial not only to the sinner, but to the man, preacher or layman who, possessing some of the divine love, proclaims that only he or others like him are the sons of God. And can I just mention here, I see this in people who come to our seminars who think some of them ironically haven't really even received divine love or very much no. divine love at this point. Yeah. But they do... Uh, some people feel, right, well, I know the truth now when, mm. when they haven't actually received much of it into their hearts, but mm -hmm. they've heard someone very eloquent speak about it mm -hmm. and it makes a lot of sense. And mm -hmm. so they have this feeling that, well, you know... They automatically think they're better. They think they're better. They think that they... very. It reminds me a little of the emotions that we observed in this preacher, mm -hmm. feeling that... They are saved and everyone else is not. Yes. And um, So their, their they, feelings are not much different than the average Christian, actually. Yes, yep. yes. And, and as you've just pointed out in this message, that has some very dark implications for them and it is mm. not the way that God feels. Exactly. Um, so they, they'll never actually be at one with God, keeping those feelings. No, and if, if they were at one with God, the feeling they would have had would be very different. They would have a very humble feeling towards their brothers and sisters who don't or have not received divine love. A compassionate feeling, a desire to, to show, and not an inflated sense of self about Definitely it. Definitely not. No. And they wouldn't even see themselves as the leaders of divine love. They would just see, them, see the need of maintaining their own relationship with God mm. and so therefore reflecting divine love in their life. But yes. yeah, the attitude would be very different than the attitude that many of the people who come to our seminars display to others. Yeah. And we often remark, you and I, don't we, how if people judge divine truth on what they see other people other than ourselves act like, then we shake our heads often and go, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> because a lot of the times the people are acting completely out of harmony with the principles. Yeah, and again, though, we don't have a feeling of, of being better than those people. I have sincere compassion for a lot of them because, yeah. as we've discussed earlier in this message, you know, I've been through a lot of the emotions that I know that they are yet to go through. The problem, and... though, is they become like this teacher. Mm. They become like the preacher who is the greatest enemy to man. Yeah, they they portray something that is false as truth, and then they refer. They, and then they even take one step further and they say that I taught them it, yes. which is really really off. And I feel it's very very damaging. very damaging to God's truth on the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you are one of these people who continuously do that, <laughs> my suggestion is to you, you need to stop doing that because you're really doing some damage to your soul. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I feel the law of attraction is evidencing to these people. Of course. That they are not acting in harmony with love because yeah. they're being rejected. They're By being... society generally. Yes. Yeah, the reality is whenever, wherever we go in society, in one-on-one -on -one interactions, we have lovely interactions with people most of the time. It's only people who interact with us via the internet who email us or something who've never met us who interact badly. You know, with media now, we, re we have good interactions with a lot of them. With people generally in public, we have really good interactions with the majority of people. Mm. And, and uh, our suggestion to people who are not finding that, well, yeah, you're probably doing quite a lot of things that are out of harmony with the divine truth that we're actually trying to teach you yeah. to practice. And, and you're definitely doing things out of harmony with love. To at least <coughs> question to at least question, is it divine truth that I'm really presenting to these people? Or know? is it just or my it... rage and anger with a, with a wrapper of uh, <laughs> you know, intellectual ideas? Yeah, am I using divine truth terminology as an excuse for badness? Well, we see a lot of people doing that, yeah. don't we? A lot of people are using divine truth terminology to, as a, to teach badness, actually. Mm -hmm. 
and to actually be bad even mm. inside of themselves, to be our unloving inside mm. of themselves. And we're getting to the point now where we're feeling like we just would like to remove some of those people from our seminars because they are affecting the spirit of our seminars quite significantly mm. as well. Many of these people who arrogantly assume they know the divine truth when it's very obvious through their day-to-day -day life, they have no knowledge of it whatsoever and hardly any desire to practice it actually. Mm. And they just use it as, a, as a talk, something to talk about. And in that regard, they've become like many of the mm. preachers of Christendom. They've, mm. they've become many of the preachers in Christendom have really had not had a, hard, a heart touched by love. Mm. And instead all they're doing is teaching a whole heap of philosophies. Mm. And, and really many people who hear the divine truth, the heart hasn't been touched by love yet. And yet they go ahead and teach the philosophy without the heart. Mm. And you're da you are damaging yourself and others doing this. And you are actually becoming man's greatest enemy to man yeah. by doing yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. So as Paul said, they see through a glass darkly, but then they shall see face to face. And when they do, they will see such evidences and manifestations of the Father's love that they will know that they and their sinning brothers are all sons of the Father. And here I was referring to the people who see through a glass darkly are the ones who think they don't. Yes. <laughs> the other ones who I'm talking about. Yes. And so, so I was saying, although one may be an heir to the celestial kingdom and the divine essence of the Father, while the other may be an heir only to the pure love of the Father, to bless and make them happy in the pure natural love and perfect manhood, which the so-called Adam possessed before his fall. So I'm saying, like, it's the people often who think that they know the truth. And many of the people coming along to our seminars fall into this category. They think they know the truth. They are teaching untruth. They are teaching lies through their attitude. They are demonstrating a lack of love, which is a teaching. They're even implying that I'm teaching them these mm. things, same things they're teaching others, which I am not. And on top of that, they damage their own soul. They damage the soul of others. They become this enemy. And, and in the end, they get darker and they see darker. They see less and less and less. So we see people who've come along to our seminars over four or five years who actually see less today about love than they did five years ago. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and it's not for want of you talking about it. No, <laughs> or demonstrating it to them personally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's a reference there to a verse in 1 Corinthians, verse 13. Uh, chapter, chapter 13. Chapter 13, rather, yeah. where, where, where Paul was speaking about love and the importance of love mm -hmm. and then people who do not love do not see. And also, um, you know, as we grow closer to God, that's when we start to see face to face, we start to see with clarity. But when we're far away from God, we see through this cloudy glass that yeah. we, we're not seeing the full truth of things and we're well, not if seeing we don't, what love really is. Yeah, well, I feel if we don't see through the eyes of love, we can't see anything anyway. Mm. We just can't see anything anyway. Mm. And many, many of the people we listen to who have heard some of our teachings and then tell others our teachings and we hear back and we go, yeah, that's not what we teach. Um, they haven't heard, they, they can't even see because they have no love in their soul yet. They can't mm. see or little love in their soul. They can't see even the damage they're doing. Mm. And they're, they're blind to the lack of love. Mm. And if, you, if you're blind with love, you're blind to everything else. You know? Yeah. yeah. yeah so. Anyway, I say, I must stop now, but in doing so, say that you must not let what any of these orthodox believers may say disturb your faith in our communications, for they know only what the Bible tells them, and you know the truths we declare. <laughs> I, will come and write, I will soon come and write you a message of truth that I've been waiting some time to write. Believe that I love you and I'm with you, praying for you and helping you with my influence. Good night, and may the Father bless you, your brother and friend, Jesus. Yeah, thank you, darling, for that <laughs> message. I hope you made it this far with us, <laughs> um, because I feel you shared some really beautiful things um, throughout the message. There's a lot of uh, theme wasn't there about the importance of truth in receiving love, mm. the fact that we have to use our will <laughs> mm. to receive the love, mm. um, and the the damage we can do 
when we, we teach untruth as truth, especially mm. relating to God and God's nature. Yeah. yeah. And uh, in later messages, we, well, I tried to have a series of messages on this subject of what stops people from receiving divine love. Because when we're in the spirit world, you can see very easily the emotions and feelings that stop people from receiving love and, uh, and in particular receiving God's love. And, uh, and I feel that a lot of our messages weren't as successful as I would have liked to, to have had them be in terms of helping Paget understand why he at times wasn't receiving divine love. And um, one of our next messages we're going to discuss further on this subject about, um, you know, what are some of those things, motions as well, desires, passions, emotions and everything that affect the reception of divine love and why divine love stops flowing even when some people think they've got a desire for it. Yeah. 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 So we'd like to thank, thank you, you guys for persisting with us for the last couple of hours, perhaps it was. <laughs> Not sure how long it went. And uh, in, in, we've enjoyed your company with us today. And we'd like to thank again Lena, who's in this camera over here, and Igor, who's behind the camera in front of me, uh, for recording our session today. Thanks, guys. <laughs>